data is more relevant than ever. On television and online, C-SPAN is your unfiltered view of government, so you can make up your own mind. Brought to you as a public service by your cable or satellite provider. A Senate Judiciary Subcommittee held a hearing on Google and its censorship policy. Google's Public Policy and Government Affairs Vice President testified during the first part of the hearing. This is an hour and 40 minutes. This hearing's called to order. Good afternoon. Let me say to folks who are attending, I apologize. The hearing was delayed in our start time. We had a series of votes on the Senate floor that just concluded. And so welcome. Welcome to our witnesses. This past April, this subcommittee held a hearing on social media bias with witnesses from Facebook and Twitter. As I noted then, any, any inquiry into big tech censorship practices must take an especially hard look at Google. That's what we're doing here today. Google's control over what people hear, watch, read, and say is unprecedented. Almost 90% of internet searches in the United States use Google. Google's domination of the search engine market is so complete that to Google, is now a commonplace verb. With that market power, Google can and often does control our discourse. And sometimes tech companies talk about their products and the effects of those products as though they're forces outside of big tech's control. As we've heard time and time again, big tech's favorite defense is it wasn't me, the algorithm did it. But Google's search engine isn't some supernatural force. It's a computer program written and maintained by people. So every time we search on Google, we see only the web pages that Google decides we should see, in the order that Google decides we should see them. Type a few letters into the search bar, and Google will tell you what you should be looking for. The same is true of Google's subsidiary, YouTube, the second most visited web page in existence. When you search on YouTube, programs written by people at YouTube provide you with the results. When you watch a video, a program written by the people at YouTube suggests what you should watch next. And when you submit a, a video, people at YouTube determine whether you've engaged in so-called hate speech, an ever-changing and vague standard meant to give censorship an air of legitimacy. This is a staggering amount of power to ban speech, to manipulate search results, to destroy rivals, and to shape culture. More and more, Americans are demanding accountability from big tech for that massive power. One thing is certain, Congress never intended to empower large technology com companies to control our speech when it passed Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. That provision, Section 230, gave tech companies special privileges that nobody else gets. If the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal were to publish an op-ed that libeled a private citizen, they can be held responsible. This is the case even when those organizations don't write the content that breaks the law. They can be held responsible merely for publishing it. Not so for companies like Google and YouTube. If someone uses one of those services to commit slander, or to trans transmit classified material, or to traffic guns or drugs, far too often Google is off the hook. Section 230 makes it immune. 
big tech gets a perk, a subsidy that no one else does. Fox News, MSNBC, or anybody else. This immunity, however, was part of a deal. It was a trade. Section 230, the text of it, refers to the Internet as, quote, a forum for a true diversity of political discourse. That was the trade at the heart of Section 230. This is because we expected tech companies in the business of carrying other speech wouldn't favor any side when they did so. There wouldn't be a conservative internet and a liberal internet. There'd just be the internet. That bargain today is falling apart. Big tech continues to reap the benefits of a Section 230 subsidy. But the American people do not. The American people are instead subject to both overt censorship and covert manipulation. I believe it's time to rethink that deal. If big tech cannot provide us with evidence, clear, compelling data and evidence, that it's not playing big brother with its vast, immense powers, there's no reason on earth why Congress should give them a special subsidy through Section 230. And that takes us to the heart of the problem. Big tech is anything but transparent. Google is happy to collect data on everyone, everywhere, constantly. On you, on me, on all of us. They make sure they know what you search, what you shop for online, what you like. They track your location within a matter of feet so that they know when you visit a physical store. But the information sharing is a one-way street. This must change. Google cannot simply hide behind its algorithms. Big tech's algorithms and search engines only do what humans at companies like Google tell them to do. Just as big tech needs and wants data on all of us. The American people need and want data on big tech. They need it to profit. We need it to protect free speech. And I hope that today, Google will start to answer some of our questions fully and candidly so that we can assess how we can work together to protect the robust marketplace of ideas that American political discourse has been built upon. Senator Harum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The calendar says it's July 16th, but it feels like Groundhog Day in the United States Senate. A little more than three months ago, this subcommittee held a hearing to explore allegations of anti-conservative bias in the tech industry. My friends on the other side were critical of witnesses from Facebook and Twitter. They claimed a vast conspiracy to silence conservative voices. After listening to some of the comments from that hearing, you might think that some liberal mastermind sits at the controls of those platforms, looking at 510,000 Facebook posts and 350,000 tweets posted every minute and removes anything that might al align with the Republican Party platform. I repeat now what I said then. Claims of anti-conservative bias in the tech industry are baseless. Study after study has debunked suggestions of political bias on the part of Facebook, Google, and Twitter. In June of this year, The Economist released the findings of a year-long analysis that ran on search results on Google's news tab. It found no evidence that Google biases its results against conservatives. In April, Media Matters completed a 37-week study into alleged conservative censorship on Facebook. It found that right-leaning pages actually outperformed, outperformed left-leaning pages in terms of overall interactions with users. Earlier this year, Twitter performed a five-week analysis of tweets sent by all members of the House and Senate. It found no statistically significant difference between the number of times a tweet by a Democratic member is viewed as compared to a tweet by a Republican member. One of our witnesses, Professor Francesca Tripodi, has done her own research in this area. 
and she found no evidence that Google censors conservative content either in its main search product or on YouTube. In fact, she has found that conservative commentators like Mr. Prager, another of the witnesses today, are extremely adept at optimizing their content for Google's search engine, allowing them to capture massive audiences. Undeterred by this evidence, here we are again, three months after that initial hearing with Facebook and Twitter, it is now Google's turn to be raked over the coals. Google will be accused of political motives for some common sense actions that are entirely within their rights. Just like we saw at the president's so-called, quote, social, social media summit last week, President Trump invited a rogues gallery of social media's leading racists and conspiracy theorists to hear about supposed censorship by tech companies. But none of these people had actually been banned from any platform. Each remains free to use the megaphone social media provides to spread their messages of conspiracy and hate. This tilting at windmills comes at a cost. Fears of being tarred as biased have made tech companies hesitant to deal with the real problems of racist and harassing content on their platforms. According to a report by Vice, Twitter is afraid to use the proactive algorithmic approach it uses to remove ISIS-related content to rid the platform of white supremacist content. The reason? Twitter is afraid it might also catch content posted by Republican politicians. YouTube dragged its feet before taking any action against conservative commentator Steven Crowder, despite being informed of Crowder's two-year homophobic harassment campaign against journalist Carla Mazza. When YouTube did finally take action, it took the half measure of removing advertisements from Crowder's videos rather than removing him from the platform entirely. Browbeating the tech industry for a problem that does not exist also draws attention away from the real problems with Google and other tech companies. Last month, a New York Times investigation found that YouTube's recommendation engine served as a roadmap for pedophiles to find videos of younger and younger girls, sometimes as young as five or six years old. That followed a Wired report on the way pedophiles used the comment section of YouTube videos to identify and share videos of children. A recent Wall Street Journal investigation found that YouTube is overrun by videos pushing fake claims for cancer cures. This is after YouTube stoked the flames of the anti-vax movement to the point that measles has returned to this country. Another New York Times feature documented the radicalization of a young man who followed YouTube's recommended videos down an alt-right rabbit hole. Google is a big, successful company. It employs some of the smartest people in the country. There is no question in my mind that it can solve these problems, real problems. Unfortunately, as long as we're ma busy making Google defend itself from clear and, with clear and convincing evidence, no less, from bogus claims of anti-conservative bias, it has no incentive to address these real issues. I'm hoping another of our witnesses can shine some light in this area. Andy Parker is the father of journalist Allison Parker. Allison worked for CBS affiliate WDBJ in Roanoke, Virginia. In August 26, 2015, she and her colleague Adam Ward were conducting a live interview when they were attacked by a gunman. Allison and Adam died at the scene. Video of the shooting quickly spread on social media, including Google's YouTube. For the past four years, Andy has sent letters to Google. He has met with Google. He has flagged videos on YouTube. He has begged and pleaded that these videos come down. Despite Andy's efforts, you can still find video of the tragedy on YouTube to this day. And I want Google to tell us why that is. I look forward to hearing from Andy. His work to shine a light on Google's failures honors Allison's memory. It also provides a great public service, as I hope this subcommittee, the full Judiciary Committee, and the Senate writ large start to focus on the real problems presented by the tech industry and demand action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now happy to introduce our first witness.
Mr. Karan Bhatia from Google. Karan Bhatia currently heads Google's Global Public Policy and Government Relations Department. Before joining Google, he served as Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Industry and Security from 2001 to 2003, as Assistant Secretary of Transportation for Aviation and International Affairs from 2003 to 2005, as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative from 2005 to 2007, and as Head of General Electric's Government Affairs Division from 2008 until 2018. He's a, he is a graduate of Princeton University and Columbia Law School. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Bhatia. Would you please stand and be sworn in? Would you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Mr. Bhatia, you may make your opening statement. Thank you, Senators. My name is Karan Bhatia. I lead the government affairs and public policy function at Google. Previously, as mentioned, I served in the George W. Bush administration. And earlier in my career, I spent time at the Heritage Foundation and the Claremont Institute. And in college, I was editor of our conservative publication, the Princeton Tory. I am a first generation American. My parents imparted to me an abiding passion for the principles of free speech, democracy, and free markets. And this same passion makes me enormously gratified to work at Google, a company that embodies these values every day around the world. Google is a proudly American company growing across the US. We're investing more than $13 billion to expand our presence in 14 states this year, creating thousands of American jobs. We are also a global company and a big American exporter competing vigorously with competitors from around the world. Through our Grow with Google program, we are proud to work with thousands of small American businesses, enabling them to tap into the commercial opportunity of the internet. We are a company focused on the future as well, investing billions of dollars annually in R&D and innovating new products to help people live better lives. For example, by applying artificial intelligence to enable earlier detection of cancer or predict natural disaster. But above all, we are a company of more than 100,000 people with a wide range of views, nationalities, and backgrounds dedicated to the company's mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. We live in an amazing time for the free flow of ideas. Never before in the history of mankind has it been possible for so many people to share so many ideas with so many others at so low a cost and through so many different avenues. Internet platforms have been transformative and powerful tools for the marketplace of ideas. Among the many beneficiaries of the internet have been political groups. From the Tea Party movement in the United States to the Arab Spring, the internet has enabled people to spread political messages and build political communities. Providing a platform for sharing a broad range of information is core to our mission. It is also core to our business model. Google needs to be useful for everyone, regardless of race, nationality, or political leanings. We have a strong business incentive to prevent anyone from interfering with the integrity of our products or the results we provide to our users. So let me be clear, Google is not politically biased. Indeed, we go to extraordinary lengths to build our products and enforce our policies in an analytically objective, apolitical way. Our platforms reflect the online world that exists. Our job, which we take very seriously, is to deliver to users the most relevant and authoritative information out there. And studies have shown that we do just that. Objective third-party studies, including most recently a comprehensive year-long assessment by The Economist of Google's results, have found no evidence of bias in either direction. Additionally, in May of this year, our data scientists analyzed daily click-through rates on search results to the official websites of members of Congress. The data showed no difference in these metrics, whether the member was a Republican or a Democrat. We also analyzed official YouTube channels for all senators who have them, and we consistently found a balance between Republicans and Democrats. Our platforms, such as Google Search or YouTube, deal with massive amounts of information. And to manage these volumes, we rely on algorithms and implement testing and evaluation by third-party raters. None of our systems are designed to filter out individuals or groups based on political viewpoints. 
Operating at the scale we do, we're bound to get criticism from both sides, and we do. From time to time, for example, political ads may violate our advertising guidelines, and we've disallowed ads from both Democrats and Republicans. From time to time, our knowledge panels, which help you find quick facts when you search for information about topics like Hillary Clinton or the California Republican Party, may reflect erroneous information from the web and will need to be corrected. We work hard to learn from our mistakes and improve our products, but these mistakes have affected both parties and are not the product of bias. As technology continues to play an increasingly essential role in the lives of Americans, we know that users expect the highest degree of integrity from our products and that we must meet that expectation every day. If we don't, our users will go elsewhere. And that is why we invest so heavily in these systems and tools that help us surface the content that is most relevant to our users in an analytically objective, apolitical way. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bhatia. Uh, my first question will not surprise you. Uh, it's a simple question. Does Google consider itself a neutral public forum? Uh, Senator, we operate a number of platforms, and they are constructed and operated to be politically neutral or, or apolitical. So, so let me, does Google, the Google search page, let's just focus on that for a moment. Does mm -hmm. Google consider the Google search page to be a neutral public forum? It, we, we construct it, we build it, and we operate it to be politically neutral. Does Google consider YouTube to be a neutral public forum? Uh, similarly, Senator, we build and construct it, maintain it uh, with our algorithms to be politically neutral. Uh, Mr. Bhatia, um, I'm going to ask my staff to, to give you a hard copy uh, of a document that was released recently uh, that, that we also sent to you ahead of time, so this should not be a surprise. Uh, it is a document that at least purports to be authored by Google. Uh, the title of the document is The Good Censor. Um, how can Google reassure the world that it protects users from harmful comment, content while still supporting free speech? And it's dated March of 2018. It, is this document, in fact, a, a document that was, that was prepared uh, within Google? I, I, I've seen the document before, Senator. I've seen references to it. I understand that it was, yeah. So I, I want to refer to you, and the copy you have, the only alteration to it is we've written page numbers on it just for ease of reference. So those are handwritten. Other than that, this is identical to what we printed from online. And with no objection, I'm going to enter a copy of this in the record with the notation that we did write page numbers on it. Um, I want to refer you initially to page 14. Or in page 14, this Google document says an important U.S. federal statute from 1996 supports this position of neutrality. And it describes how sec under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, tech firms have legal immunity from the majority of the content posted on their platforms. The, this protection has empowered YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit to create spaces for free speech without fear of legal action. So Google itself understood on the face of this document, that Section 230, that immunity is predicated upon, as the title of this page says, neutrality. I'd now like to refer you to page 65 of the document. If you can put this chart up as well. So on page 65 of the document, this Google document says, tech, for, tech firms are performing a balancing act between two incompatible positions. On the one side, create an unmediated marketplace of ideas, 100% commit to the American tradition that prioritizes free speech for democracy, not civility, by creating spaces where all values, including civility norms, are always open for debate. That's on the one side in, in Google's own assessment. On the other side is create well-ordered spaces for safety and civility, 100% commit to the European tradition that favors dignity over liberty and civility over freedom by censoring, and I will note this is Google's word, censoring, racial and religious hatred even when there's no provocation to violence. Now this Google document lays this out as a balancing act between two incompatible positions, but yet 
two pages later in the document, on page 67, Google concludes, in the eyes of big tech, which side has won out? And indeed, according to Google's document, The Good Censor, Google says tech firms have gradually shifted away from unmediated free speech and towards censorship and moderation. So I guess my, my first question is, is this accurate? Does Google engage in, using your own words, censorship and moderation? So, Senator, at the first, just to place this document in context, this was, uh, as I understand it, uh, sort of a thought experiment and sort of a discussion that was underway among our marketing team. It was a marketing document. And it was thinking about sort of this broader tension that exists um, between, on the one hand, being a forum for free speech, uh, and on the other hand, seeking to introduce certain rules of the road or, or community guidelines to make sure that the online environment is one that is, um, you know, one that users will want to participate in. And so, it was discussing that tension. It is not reflective necessarily of the views of the company as a whole. It is not. Okay, it is. Let, let me then ask my question again, Mr. Batia. Is this document prepared within Google, is it accurate? Is Google engaged in, and the terms used, are censorship and moderation, and moderation in this context, uh, I understand not to mean being moderate, but rather actively moderating the speech that occurs. Is that in fact what Google is doing, which is censoring and moderating speech on its platform? So I would not say that we are censoring speech on our platform. In fact, there is a dramatic, you know, there's the, the, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, remarkable opportunities for every part of the political spectrum to be able to participate through, online, through the online platforms. We do have, for instance, let's take our YouTube platform. We do have community guidelines that uh, precludes, for instance, people from uploading videos that might contain violent extremism, that might contain, um, uh, and might contain hate speech that would uh, prescribe or encourage incite violence well, against and let's be protected clear, this minorities. This document also that y'all prepared, you've got the logos, if I'm recognizing them correctly, for Facebook, for Twitter, for Google and YouTube, all on the side uh, towards censorship and moderation, and in fact, the chart goes on to say, create well-ordered spaces for safety and c civility. And then it get, has three words, politicized, editor, and publisher. Are those accurate descriptions? Is, is Google, are YouTube editors and publishers? Uh, no, sir, Senator, I don't believe we are. And again, I'm not sure the context in which those words were placed up there. but. Uh, but no, we, we are not. So, so this Google document, your position is it's just wrong, and is that? I, my, my position is that this is, there are many documents that get produced where you task teams to go off and think about what's going on in the ecosystem. I think this document reflects thinking, you know, that's being done by a marketing team. And, and in fact, the next page of, of this slide deck, which I don't think I have in larger form, but I'll read it for, for you. It's page 68 in the version in front of you says, for a long time, we thought of censorship in terms of government and nation states. And I think we're now in an era in which people are starting to realize that private companies, probably more than ever before, control people's ability to amplify their voices and whether or not their speech stays up or comes down. Also, what they see and what they can listen to and what they can read. Now, there has been considerable debate, including an argument by the ranking member of this committee just a few minutes ago, that there is no censorship, that no one is engaging in, 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 in any censorship. This document, and in fact, the quote I just read, I think reflects the concerns of a great many people that Google, a massive company with monopoly power, is choosing whether to amplify people's voices, whether their speech stays up or comes down, what they see, what they can listen to, and what they can read. Do you agree that's in fact what Google's doing? I, no, no, Senator. Uh, and this, just to be clear, obviously is not, it's a quote from some third party. It's not, it's not uh, somebody, sure, at, but, but, somebody at Google. But no, Google put it in this presentation, so it, it presumably... To, to, to reflect the 
obviously the discussion that is going out uh, in general in, in uh, society uh, about whether platforms in general, which, uh, you know, have on the one hand, in many cases, a mission, a goal of trying to be uh, available for free speech, for, for new voices, for a diversity voices to be heard. And on the other hand, creating s spaces where certain kinds of speech, uh, violent extremist speech as an example, which is clearly potentially damaging and threatening to society and to the community of users is not permitted. So that's a tension, a natural tension that exists. And I think it's, you know, again, it's not our quote, but it's not an unreasonable thing to expect companies to be thinking about that. All right, so let me ask the last question, uh, my last question for the first round. Uh, you have repeatedly made reference to violent extremism and, and hate speech. Uh, one of the companies that has been demonetized by Google repeatedly is Prager University. Dennis Prager is sitting here. He will be testifying on the next panel. Uh, Mr. Prager is, in my judgment, a highly learned, erudite individual, studied and well thought on a great many issues. And in my experience, I've always found that I learn when listening to Mr. Prager, whether I happen to agree with a particular issue or, yet, or not. And yet, YouTube actively censors the content Mr. Prager is producing. Is it your view that Mr. Prager is somehow disseminating dangerous ideas or, or ideas that fit into the buckets you were talking about of violent extremism or, or hate speech? Uh, no, Senator. Maybe if I can just explain. Mr. Mr. Prager is a YouTube success story. Mr. T. Prager has more than two million uh, uh, followers, as I understand it. Um, Mr. Prager is, uh, and, and all of Mr. Prager's content is available on YouTube, the, 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 the main YouTube channel. We do have um, a very small percent of our subscribers who opt for what we call restricted mode. These are mostly institutions like churches or perhaps schools where there's certain um, more mature content that they choose not to have access to. Now, this is less than 2% of the overall YouTube watchers, but we do feel it's important that to give those, those institutions that degree of control. There is a small percent of Mr. Prager's overall content, as I understand it, less than a quarter of his content that is deemed to be in that category of more mature. And so for that very small percentage, they will not have access to Mr. Prager's um, more mature content. Other than that, it is complete, and, and just to be clear, these are, this is content, for instance, maybe perfectly acceptable to watch, but for those, it's perhaps references to violence or war or rape, things like that. So that's the, so that's the basis. My understanding, just for the record, is, is that uh, PragerU has produced 325-minute videos and that YouTube has censored 56 of them, so roughly 20%. Among those that are censored inc include a video on the Ten Commandments. Uh, another one censored includes a video on the history of the nation of Israel. Uh, the restrictions are purportedly for blocking things like pornography, but apparently in YouTube's world, talking about the Ten Commandments and the, and the nation of Israel is comparable and, and, and should be blocked. N respectfully, Senator, that's not right. So what I, what, I, so what I was trying to explain is all of Mr. Prager, those, those, the Ten Commandments, all those are available to 98% of YouTube viewers, 98.5, I believe. 1.5% of our viewers have, in, have activated, again, this restricted mode, churches, uh, schools, maybe libraries, that don't want to have their viewers uh, uh, exposed to more mature content. The video, I believe the Ten Commandments video, for instance, contains references to murder and I believe potentially Nazism or World War II, something along those lines. There are other videos that have in that category, in the, the number that you referenced, 56, whatever it is, that may make reference to rape. That's the reason, but they're not censored. They are simply, they're available to everybody who's using normal YouTube. They are not available to the small subset who have chosen to activate restricted mode. Senator Hirono. Thank you. 
it's very clear that uh, all of these platforms, uh, does, uh, they do remove certain kinds of content. That is not the issue that the chairman is trying to focus upon. And really, the premise of this hearing is not the removal of, of um, for example, violent speech, but the premise of this hearing is the targeted removal of conservative speech or content. So, uh, uh, you know, that's what the chair would like to focus us on. And um, apparently the Ten Commandments video has Nazi imagery, so that may be one of the reasons that it's uh, restricted. Does Google discriminate against conservatives in some way? Do you actually have an algorithm that somehow identifies, I, I don't know, the, the, the world of conservative content? Because you just mentioned that Mr. Prager uh, who puts a lot of this kind of content on various platforms. He has, what, five, <coughs> two million followers, and most of his content is uh, totally available on YouTube, so I find it really amazing that he is here to testify that he's being um, targeted for content removal. So anyway, does Google discriminate against con conservatives, whether on Google Search, YouTube, or any other platform? No, there, Madam yeah. Senator. Does Google search discriminate against conservative content? No, Madam Senator. We, we don't factor political leanings into our algorithms at all. What role does a user's political party affiliation play in applications of Google's content moderation policies? We don't know our users' political, uh, you know, we, it, it bears no relevance into our political, into our um, algorithmic returns. You mentioned, uh, well, obviously you're familiar with uh, Dennis Prager. He is a witness on the second panel, and he has sued Google for alleged censor censorship of his videos on YouTube. So are you you're familiar with his organization, PragerU? I am. Approximately how many PragerU's videos are available on YouTube? Um, I don't have the exact number. Oh, does uh, 672 sound right? It could be right, yes, ma'am. How much does PragerU pay to host those videos on YouTube? Uh, I don't believe we charge anything. How many times have PragerU's videos been viewed on YouTube? Uh, I don't have an exact number for how many views all of them have, but again, I know that uh, he has millions of subscribers. Well, would it surprise you to learn that PragerU's videos have been viewed nearly one billion times on YouTube? No, it would not. Have any PragerU video, PragerU's videos been removed from YouTube? Totally removed? No, ma'am. So I want to show you a chart. This is a version of a chart Google submitted in the lawsuit by Mr. Prager. It shows the percentage of different organizations' videos that are not available in restrictive mode, restrictive mode due to mature content. So it shows that fewer than 23% of Prager use videos are unavailable in restrictive mode mode. And this is less than the percentage of videos unavailable in restricted mode from the Huffington Post, Vox.com, The Daily Show, The Young Turks, and other organizations that are, that are generally viewed as liberal. You notice that uh, a lot more of those so-called liberal sites are, um, have a higher percentage. So to your understanding, is this chart which was submitted under penalty of perjury accurate? Yes, Senator. So if, if, if Google's treatment of Prairie U is meant to show Google's anti-conservative bias, Google isn't doing a very good job of it. So uh, to go further, Andy Parker is in the audience and uh, will be a witness on the second panel. Andy's daughter, Allison, as I mentioned, was murdered on live television while conducting an interview in 2015. Footage of that murder can still be found on YouTube today. I understand that when Andy first approached Google about having the footage taken down, Google's response was that Andy himself should identify any videos of the murder and flag them to Google for a takedown. Google is an $800 billion company with nearly 100,000 employees. Why should a father have to search for, watch, and flag videos of his daughter's murder in order to have it removed from YouTube? Why can't Google do this itself? So, uh, Senator, first of all, let me start by uh, expressing my own, and on behalf of Google, uh, you, you know, uh, deepest sympathy to Mr. Parker for what he's gone through. Um, 
uh, the and we have indeed engaged with him over the course of time. Um, there are a number of sets of potential concerns with different kinds of videos. So if I can explain, the first are videos that are hoax videos. So there were videos that were put out um, that uh, es essentially tried to make the case that uh, the shooting of his daughter had not happened. Those videos. Uh, we violate our policies, and we have indeed uh, taken all of those down. Um, the second set of videos that you're ref referencing are a variety of videos that may be, um, for instance, news footage or other things of uh, the the shooting. And um, there, um, w there are a couple of concerns. You know, one is the question of. Uh, copyright. In other words, are these videos that are owned potentially by Mr. Parker? I understand there is some um, evidence of that. If there is, obviously we would seek to respect the um, copyright holders' desires. But where there are simply news videos that a major news outlet might have put out that would contain sort of portions of the footage, that then becomes sort of part of the corpus that we would uh, generally tend to leave up. So that's, I think, what we're trying to work our way through. So you have taken down some of this footage, and the ones that you legally can take down. Yes. Do you have any of us, uh, can you give us any idea of how many, what, what, whatever the right term is, how many of these individual uh, uh, posts that have been put, put up that, that you all take down? Uh, with respect to this video, I, I don't have the number, but we can happily get back to you on I that. I mean, are we Senator. talking about, what, 100,000 of these? We, in general, if you're talking about videos that, that we take down, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of videos that get seek to get uploaded every, every day, every week that we take down for so, violation of our terms one way or another. There are, uh, just to put it in scale, every minute there are 500 hours worth of video that is sought to be uploaded to YouTube. So are you we, still taking down the, the, these kinds of uh, videos relating? Where, to we, the where we find videos and we deploy, uh, we deploy machine tools, you know, algorithmic tools to try to capture what is uh, violative of, our, of, of, of legal restriction or policy, and we do indeed try and take them down based on, based on those tools. So are, are you taking... Um, action really to, to do this or is it only as somebody points out that oh there's another video no 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 senator I mean there again given the, the quantity of video that we have out there we have to depend upon machines effectively to try and spot create fingerprints and then spot videos that are violative of our policies our community guidelines or others so we certainly use that as a first instance um, we then also do look to members of the community to inform us or point us to things that they also think should be taken down. And when pointed out to us, we have human reviewers look at them and, and, and take them down as well where it's violative. So when Mr. Parker first came to you, it was more than uh, unfortunate that the message he got from Google is go out there and find all these yourself. That, that was definitely uh, not a good thing. Understood. A good approach for you folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Blackburn. I'm sorry, do we have seven minute rounds? Uh, we, we do have seven. If oh, you, okay. you want to take some more time. Sure. sure. I thought we were in five minutes. Okay. So um, just this week, we've been able to find more footage on Allison's murder on YouTube. And, and again, you know, it, it seems as though vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Parker that uh, Google has infinite resources, near infinite resources. and. Um, I would like to know that you are actively uh, taking down on your own volition these videos. And I think I have a screenshot of one of the videos still uh, available on YouTube. And the person who posted the video made no attempt to hide his content. This, the title is, uh, quote, breaking WDBJ shooting video footage. It's like screaming out there. And the description states, a gunman is on the loose after killing two broadcast journalists in a shooting that was captured on live television, et cetera. And then I understand that content moderation can be a difficult tax, but it doesn't look like it should be in this case. It's right out there. What possible explanation does Google have for why this video slipped through the cracks and has remained available on YouTube since August of 2015? Again, I, I'm not familiar with this specific vid video that you've got a picture of up there, Senator. Um, it, 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 again, would depend upon the nature of the video that had been put up. If it was, 
again, a hoax video of some type, it clearly would transgress our policies and would come down and, um, you know, should come down. If it is news footage uh, that another well, news uh, let's assume that this up. is not any of those categories that you can't. So if it if it okay. violates, just to be clear, if it violates our policies, it should come down. I and I wouldn't know why it would be up. If yeah. it doesn't violate our policies, obviously we. Would, uh, that's so does it, that uh, in and of itself breaking the, the, the shooting footage, I, wouldn't that just I, raise a lot of red flags? Wouldn't it, it, it violate? Would, it would depend well. really upon the nature of the video, in all honesty. There are sometimes news events that uh, would be things that uh, might be difficult for viewers to watch, but nonetheless would be, you know, put out there on major news channels and would be probably appropriately included, but again, I can't really tell from looking at well, this. Well, uh, is it the same screenshot that we're, I'm referring to? So again, this is a screenshot from May 30, 2019, it's pretty recent, showing that Andy's team flagged this video for Google. It appears that the only thing Google did in response mm -hmm. is label the video as adult content and uh, ask users to confirm their age before watching the video. Uh, it shouldn't it, I would think this would be just taken down. And what is Google going to do to ensure that this video and others like it are removed from YouTube quickly and that they don't come back? So why would you allow people to view something like this rather than taking it down? Again, Senator, it's difficult for me to comment on this specific video without knowing what it is. I, there will um, be videos that uh, will be news footage that may be disturbing to people, but nonetheless is legitimate news footage, in which case giving it the appropriate label may be uh, the, you know, the outcome consistent with our policies. On the other hand, if it is, violates and transgresses one of our policies, whether it's, be, whether it's the, the, the policy against um, hoax videos, whether it's um, you know, uh, any of the other policies that we might have, um, we would then look to take it down. So, Again, difficult for me to say, but we're happy to look into Why don't you look into this? Yeah. Uh, because I started again, I'm not sure where I am on the time frame here. I think I had about two minutes you were left. At seven when you oh. Off. Yeah. oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, well, you all are being very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bhatia, thank you for being thank here. You, we appreciate it. About a year ago, I said that I felt like 2018 marked the end of the age of innocence for the internet. And if you look forward to this summer, we've got Facebook that has been hit with a $5 billion fine from the FTC. Uh, in my opinion, that's not enough. It should have been 50 a billion dollars. Uh, we all know they've been in violation of their privacy agreements. You all at Google are facing a Justice Department inquiry, and if Microsoft's uh, experience with their 20-year antitrust saga is any indication, then, uh, you know, I hope you realize this is very serious, and it's a serious inquiry. And uh, it seems like the problems around big tech as it has become a mature industry that they're just mushrooming. And when we talk about uh, privacy or lack thereof, data security, lack thereof, offenders that are the biggest and the worst offenders, uh, unfortunately for you all, people put Google at the top of the list. So we appreciate that you are, that you're here. I want to uh, start with you and talk a little bit about prioritization of search results. Um, I think this is important to do because I will tell you, I feel like you all push the boundaries until your hand gets slapped. As a mom and a grandmom, I would tell my kids, you know, don't do that again and they would try it again, and they would try it again, and that's kind of what I see with you all. Uh, but a big business company like you ought not to be having such childish behavior where you do something and you get your hand slapped waiting to see if we are going to get after you or a federal agency is going to rein you back in. You're always out there pushing to the limit. And in doing this, you have a practice that seems that you suppress competition. 
And we know that you have, that Google has, uh, through Google Plus, you have prioritized search results over Yelp and TripAdvisor. You did that until local search providers really pushed back on you and said you can't do that. Now we see what you're doing is consolidating many of the travel offerings together. And so you're trying to push forward to dominance in the travel market, and you're doing that through an app called Trips. And now you're going to be armed with all of these details, all of this data, all of this search data from people that use your service. And you're going to use that prioritization to wipe out competition from travel booking sites. And I'm concerned about the threat to competition that Google poses and how search prioritization harms new startups that are seeking to enter the marketplace. So let me ask you a couple of things. Does Google actively prioritize Google's own local search results, yes or no? Uh, we seek to provide users, uh, Senator, with responses to their queries Sir, that are most yes relevant no. most yes relevant no. and authoritative. Yes so, or no? Do uh, you prioritize? No, no, un unless our services, what we would put forward, it would be more relevant and authoritative. Okay. Does the Google know if its own search results are better than the third-party competitors? It would depend entirely on the different search that you search, you know. So you have all the data, you're but you're, you're not uh, quantifying and you're not prioritizing. There are billions of searches that get run every day. Sometimes we would surface information okay. that we would have, sometimes uh, The others. answer is yes, you do prioritize, and yes, you do use that information. People, uh, people aren't dumb. They can check how those search results come in. When the FTC investigated Google from 2011 to 2013, it discovered a business practice that is called co-occurrence signals. That is, Google products would be triggered to appear above the 10 blue links when the appearance of a competitor occurred in the page rank results. Does Google still use any, for, any form of co-occurrence signals to suppress the competition in search results. Senator, I, you're, you're deeper into that than I, I know the immediate answer to. I'll have to get back to you on that. I will tell you that the FTC... Why don't you submit a, uh, something in writing the, then for the committee so that we have that. Uh, this is a practice you're not supposed to be conducting at this point. You've been investigated for it. Okay, on Monday, you claimed in an op-ed that Google is not politically biased, yet you acknowledge that Google took down or limited the reach of conservative content and accounts and only did so mistakenly. If you want us to believe that Google is an equal opportunity search engine and not an equal opportunity offender, let me clarify exactly what an equal playing field would look like for you all at Google. Google should equally promote video reporting in its search results, whether the article is from CNN or Fox News. Do you agree? We have both CNN and Fox News in, in our words, news corpus. Okay. Uh, should Google equally promote news articles in its search results, whether the article be from the Huffington Post or Breitbart? I, we, we surface okay, the results that the are most to that one. responsive. Should YouTube equally promote videos from Diamond and Silk at the same time as videos from John Oliver? Again, both are in the corpus. Okay, what gets surfaced is most to that responsive. One. Thank you. I'll move on. In December 2018, reports surfaced that Google employees sought to block Breitbart from Google AdSense less than one month after President Trump took office. Google employees sought to use, quote unquote, what they called hate speech as a pretense for banning Breitbart from taking part. The emails show. Ultimately, these Google employees did not succeed in their efforts to censor 
Breitbart, has your advertising platform ever enacted policies that tended to favor certain viewpoints over others? N no, Madam Senator, we don't use uh, political indicia to influence our ads. Okay. Has Google ever blacklisted or attempted to blacklist a company, group, individual, or outlet from its advertising partners or its search results for political reasons? No, ma'am, we don't use blacklists, whitelists to influence our search results or... Uh, for what reason does Google blacklist a company? We, as I said, uh, per your previous question, we do not utilize blacklists or whitelists in our search results to favor political outcomes. It's not, doesn't happen. I have one last question, Mr. Chairman, if I have permission. In March 2019, Google set out to form a council on the future of artificial intelligence. That is something very important to us here at this committee. One topic was fairness in machine learning. Yes, ma'am. Of the eight members appointed to the council, only one conservative was appointed. That was Kay Cole James. She's the president of the Heritage Foundation. She is widely respected as a leader in the conservative movement. Yes. Her appointment caused 2,500 Google employees to sign onto a letter opposing her appointment. The AI panel fell apart after Ms. James was unfairly tarred and targeted for her policies. These days, we hear a lot about implicit bias. Mm -hmm. What has Google done to address the widespread implicit bias against conservative values that persist throughout your corporate culture? And we understand this is in the physical sense and in the virtual sense. So first of all, with respect to our corporate culture, let me again, emphasize we're 100,000 people. We're in many states around the United States, including Tennessee. Um, we are a diverse uh, group of people with many different views, but we do recognize that there could potentially be challenges with implicit bias, and that's precisely the reason that we construct our search engines, construct our platforms in such a way that bias does not get built in. And so, uh, and core to that, core to that, is the system of making sure that any change in the algorithm that could be proposed or is used is run based through a rating system, a system of search raters, which consists of thousands of people throughout the United States, I think 49 states throughout the U.S., and any change to promote one change the algorithm as being more authoritative would need to be reviewed by we all of them. We appreciate that, and at this committee, we're going to be looking and doing a deep dive into the issues of privacy, data security, antitrust, competition, censorship, prioritization, and we hope that you will come with an open mind to the table and be willing to work with us. I yell back. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this meeting. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Senator. And thank you for being here. Um, I want to first uh, ask you about an allegation which uh, actually the President surfaced on Monday. The President uh, threatened to launch a treason investigation into Google for allegedly working with the Chinese government. The claim appears to be based on a comment uh, and I'll ask that the uh, report of that comment be entered in the record if there's no objection. Without objection. Uh, a Politico uh, article uh, dated July 16th. Uh, the claim appears to be based on uh, Peter Thiel's allegation that Google has been um, somehow involved in treason. We know it's been a target of Chinese hacking, most prominently in 2009. Uh, have you found any evidence of infiltration of your management or your private data by Chinese intelligence? Absolutely not, Senator. Has Google made any decision about its contracts with the United States government based on pressure or in consultation with China? Absolutely not. Has Google turned over or in any way turned a blind eye to a leak of its software or private data 
to Chinese intelligence? Absolutely not. We take extremely seriously that the, the threat of uh, any penetration of our systems. And um, if Google software, private data, or management is breached by a foreign intelligence agency, uh, including China, will you commit to notifying this committee immediately? Uh, certainly, sir, and indeed we work closely with the law enforcement agencies of the and U.S. Other and yes. other appropriate yes. agencies. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to make an observation, which I think perhaps you've already sensed from the hearing, but also from comments made well prior to this hearing by myself over months, years, uh, but by colleagues today on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the hourglass has run out on antitrust, on privacy, on moral imperative. Uh, big tech, most particularly Google, is right now in the midst of a perfect storm. And it will require a restructuring and repurposing of what you do. And I hope that you are thinking radically, if I may use that term, uh, not radically politically, but radically in terms of the role and responsibility that you have in modern American society. Because I think it has to be changed profoundly. Uh, my complaint about the Facebook settlement, so far as what we know of it right now, is not the abjectly inadequate amount of the proposed penalty, $5 billion, is barely a tap, not even a slap on the wrist. But the apparent lack of any structural behavior or leadership reform that will be required. We don't know precisely what the outcome will be, but I think uh, that it is more than a missed opportunity. It is a forsaken obligation if there is no radical order to restructure and change Facebook. Um, on the issue that brings us here today, I want to first uh, disclose that um, um, Robbie Parker is a former constituent of mine. His eldest daughter, uh, his six-year-old daughter, Emily, was killed in uh, a shooting that is painful for any of us to recall, but most especially for him. And so I want to thank him and pay tribute to his bravery and his courage for being here a second time. Uh, also, in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that uh, the Connecticut firm representing him in his lawsuit against Alex Jones uh, is one where one of my sons, my oldest son, works as a lawyer but he and I have not discussed this case. Uh, Mr. Parker and other parents of those children repeatedly went to Google when Alex Jones and others used YouTube, YouTube to quote, uh, and I'm quoting him, regurgitate demonstrably and undeniably false information about the Sandy Hook shooting while simultaneously attacking victims' families for profit, end quote. These lies were more than just false. They were malicious. They were cruel. They incited harassment, physical threats. They forced this family literally every day to relive their loss. And as Robbie Parker told us last time he was here, for too long Google and its peers were quote unquote, complacent to the threats. Uh, this stuff is not speech, it's incitement, harassment, defamation. Um, I respectfully suggest whatever your machines are, they're not working. Would you agree? Senator, if I may, just again, uh, our hearts go out to Mr. Parker and his family for that tragedy. Um, we and absolutely, believe, we believe that hoax videos of the kind that you reference and, and were, had, he had to experience have no place on any of our platforms. And uh, we 
have taken the, the challenge, the, 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 the need to address that very seriously, including most recently amending our uh, policies earlier this year, our, 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 our uh, community guidelines, uh, to make clear that any such video that comes up will be taken down um, uh, immediately. We um, do, again, given the quantity of video that gets uploaded at any point in time, we have to depend on tools, on, on machines to, to try and spot those videos. Um, we constantly are trying to improve them, um, and, and they are improving. Um, where we miss something and it gets caught by another, uh, you know, a, a viewer, we, we then take action against it. Well, uh, speaking for Mr. Robbie Parker, who's not here today, but Annie Parker is, uh, these kinds of policies, guidelines, forgive me, platitudes, are no substitute for effective enforcement. And I have said, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, the best policies, the best laws that we make are dead letter unless they're effectively enforced. I say that as someone who spent most of my yeah. career in enforcement, not legislating. And I have to conclude, given what I saw before today and then what Senator Hirono showed you, that the machines are not working and that you are dependent as much on the victims coming to you and then often the victims not believed or not heeded. And I guess uh, I'm looking for a commitment that you'll do better machines or you'll have different ways of detecting and different ways of enforcing. But again, not just guidelines or policies, but actually investing in what's needed to make these policies and guidelines real. Senator, you absolutely have our commitment, my commitment, that we continue, will continue to invest in that, in that space. I, 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 all I can tell you is we don't want those kinds of videos up. There's, there's, there is, uh, it's certainly not conducive to the kind of uh, community we're looking to build at YouTube. It is, given the sheer quantity of video that gets uploaded, it is a tough computer science challenge, but, but we, we can continue. upload it. Well, You're individuals the one will be responsible for it. You happen to have a provision of law that dates from the inception of the internet that gives you, in my view, a very excessively broad shield of immunity. We can debate the merits of Section 230 at another time, but you can't simply unleash the monster and say it's too big to control. You have a moral responsibility, even if you have that legal protection. And again, with all due respect, I think there is a moral imperative here, and the hourglass has run out. We, we agree that, that it is a responsibility that we and all platforms have to make sure that um, you know, videos like that don't appear on our system. And what specific steps are you going to take besides guidelines and policy? It, 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 a lot of it will come down to improving the, the algorithms, uh, excuse me, improving the, 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 effectively the tools, the, the machine learning tools that we have to spot videos, to spot violative videos. Um, again, I, I will say that there's dramatic improvements happening in this space as technology improves. Um, and we are already catching far more. People will sometimes put up videos that contain snippets or will contain a bit of video and then intersplice with other forms of video and then back to the video. So there's all sorts of tools that people sometimes try to utilize to get around our policies. Um, and again, we're training machines to try and catch those as well. Um, ultimately, technology is going to have to be part of the solution here, and we're, we're you know, working. My, my time is limited, but I want to ask you just a couple more questions. Uh, has Google committed to an independent audit of how it enforces these policies, as Facebook and Twitter have promised? We consult with many people on trying to figure out what the best way of meeting these challenges are, Senator. Um, you know, so we, 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 you know, we look to them for 
input on how we're doing. We're looking for advice on how best but to meet the challenges. Is about an independent audit. Facebook and Twitter promised it. Have you committed to it? Uh, I think the answer is no. Not along the lines of what exactly you're, you're referencing, I think, but we do. The answer is no. Why not? Well, are you talking about against hoax videos specifically, Senator? Well, they've committed to an independent audit of how their policies and guidelines are enforced. We, we um, again, the, there are a lot of individual policies and guidelines that we apply. So YouTube community guidelines is an example. Um, our advertising guidelines, our search rater guidelines, there are a lot of different guidelines. Each one we utilize different forms of effectively testing and verification to see how we're doing. So I'm not sure that a single audit of the entirety of what our guidelines or policies are would be, would well, be viable. They, they committed to an audit of policy and guidelines on, specifically on civil rights, uh, which is what has brought us here today. So Google we, committed to that same kind of audit. We, we have not yet. I think it's something that we will uh, be looking at. We certainly have uh, a great deal of, um, you know, we, we, look to, we look to the civil, we have engagement with the civil rights community, with leadership in that community to but figure out how our... Limited, so I want to ask you, and I apologize for... Please. But um, last month, one of your colleagues told the Commerce Committee, and I was uh, doing some of the questioning, that recommendations for harmful misinformation have dropped, quote, by over 50 percent in the United States, end quote. These are views from YouTube's recommendation system directed by YouTube itself from systems that it controls. Uh, why have the number of views for harmful content dropped by only one half? Doesn't that, why hasn't the amount of traffic that YouTube itself is driving drop to zero. You can control that. Uh, I'm not sure I entirely followed the question, Senator, but let me see. So the, the uh, recommendation system that you're referencing beforehand, right. we have seen a significant diminution um, as we've implemented policies earlier this year that are designed to sort of get at some of these kinds of you know, content that you're referencing before, so maybe hoax videos or content that tends to be, uh, you know, um, anti-vax kind of content, you know, marginal content, significantly uh, deprioritized as we uh, have improved our algorithms for what is recommended. So we have seen a significant decrease in that. We're going to continue to work on it. Um, with respect to... I'm sorry, the sec I didn't follow the other part of the question. Well, I guess the question is why haven't you reduced it to zero? And I'm, I'm going to uh, yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I've... Okay. Happy to continue you. to engage. Thank you, Senator. Or uh, we can Please. pursue it in written. Happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you say that Google takes its content moderation responsibilities very seriously. That's your testimony here today. Is that fair to say? Um, you strive to be even-handed and neutral. We, yes, we construct our, our algorithms to be politically neutral. So Analytically that. objective and apolitical, I think, were your exact words. Exactly. Is that, is that yes. right? And you don't, you don't impose filters based on political viewpoints. That's your testimony. Uh, that's correct. And despite the fact that almost exclusively your executives' employees uh, donate to one political party, I think 1%, of the donations that came from Google in 2016 went to Republicans or Donald Trump. All the rest went to the other party, Hillary Clinton, the Democrats. It is your testimony that you, do, you never use content moderation to advance an ideological agenda. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Senator. And it's, you know, we, we, it is both contrary to our mission, contrary to our business interest, and it would be incompatible with the systems that we build to work political bias in there, which I think is why we've had third party studies, including the ones right. that I referenced, that demonstrate that we do not have political bias. And in inconsistent with your basic values, I imagine you would say. Inconsistent with our values. Except for when you do it in China, right? 
Uh, we have, have you're no, happy to censor for the repressive authoritarian Chinese regime, like for instance with Google.cn, happy to censor away any mention of Tiananmen Square, happy to help the Chinese government maintain control of all information within the, company, the country, happy to help them control the information flow to their own citizens. You're happy to do all of that. Would you call that censorship with an ideological agenda? Senator, we don't offer uh, almost any of our products in China. We don't offer Google, Google Search. Wait, 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 wait. We, Are you saying that Google CN did not include censorship tools based on what the Chinese regime asked for? Is that your testimony? Google. Just reminds you, Yandro. We, we no. have not. We have not. Google CN did not offer, did not include censorship material? Senator, I don't know what you're. You're not familiar with Google CN? I, I am, I'm, I'm referencing the fact that we exited China in 2010, and we did so because Google, at that point, we, in addition to being under attack, we felt that the censorship requirements that were being applied to Google were not compatible with, this, with the products that we were able to But you did to offer, offer Google CN. You developed it, and it included censorship tools that would have screened out things like mentions of Tiananmen Square. Is that correct? I, I'm sorry, Senator. Are you referring to Project Dragonfly? Is oh, well, one, yeah, since you, I wasn't, but since okay. you, cause that's a separate thing. But yeah. since you mentioned Project Dragonfly, why don't you tell us about it? Is it active right now? It's not, Senator. You're able to term. say that for the record. It's not active. You've abandoned Project Dragonfly? Yes, we have, we have terminated uh, that. Are, are you willing to commit today here that Google will not agree to or participate in any form of censorship with the Chinese regime in China against Chinese citizens? Or will you commit to that? You will not agree to any information or, or restrictions on data flow in China, the Chinese market? Senator, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to imagine hypothetically what you're referencing. We don't well, provide about search. Google CN, for instance. We don't represent, re reference China's uh, search in China. Fundamentally in China, we actually do very little today, certainly compared to any other major technology company. We really... Uh, so you won't block search terms for Uyghurs in concentration camps or Tiananmen Square. You won't do that in any business, any venture we, going we, forward? We, we don't. I, I no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you won't, because we know you have in the past. That's what Google CN was. You know you've contemplated it with Project Dragonfly. I'm asking you now for a commitment. I'm glad to hear you say that Project Dragonfly has been canceled. I think that's news. So that's good to hear, because there's been news reports that it's still active. So I'm, I'm delighted We've to hear that. We've been clear that, I, that we have no current plans to go into China in the search market. Uh, that's great. So that, that's great. And you're committing to me here today that you will not in the future do so and you will not engage in censorship in China. That, is so that what, I, what, I, what, what, uh, that, what we yes are willing, no, actually, what we're yes no. willing to commit to, Senator, is that any decision to ever look at going back into the China search market is one that we would take only in consultation with key stakeholders. Yeah, that's what you said in response government. to Senator Blumenthal's questions about whether or not you submit to an audit. It was the longest no in the English language. Now you're not giving me a yes or a no. Are you, let me just come back to a question that, that Senator Blumenthal asked, I thought was interesting. You're confident that Google hasn't been infiltrated by Chinese intelligence? We see no evidence of that, Senator. What, what do you think about General Dunford, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, his comment at the Atlantic Council a few months ago that typically, I'm quoting him, typically if a company does business in China, they're automatically going to be required to have a cell of the Communist Party in that company, and that is going to lead to the intellectual property from that company finding its way to the Chinese military. Do you, do you think he's right about that, wrong about that? Senator, we don't, we do, as I mentioned before, barely any business in China, so I don't but have, you have really the, the basis. Past, and you have tried to. 2010, we exited the country. That wasn't that, wasn't that long ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, well, um, You've been, my point is this, you've been more than willing to engage in ideological censorship in the largest market in the world. You have been more than happy to partner with the most repressive authoritarian regime on the planet, all for profits, whatever it is that is good for Google. Why would anybody believe you now when you say you won't, you won't submit to a third party audit, you just answered Senator Blumenthal no to that, you won't commit to me that you won't engage in censorship when it suits your purposes in China and the Chinese market, for instance, in the future. Why would anybody believe you now when you say we don't ever impose an ideological agenda? What assurances can you give us? Senator, um, I think what I can tell you is that in China today, we don't offer any of the products that you're referencing 
that would. No, I mean here. Yeah. What assurance? Why would we believe you now when you say in the United States or anywhere that you do business? Why would we believe anything Google says about what it does or does not do in terms of promoting an ideological agenda? We know you've done it in the past. We know you do it when it suits your your bottom line. Why would we believe you now? What assurances can you besides your own testimony, Senator? I, I fundamentally disagree that we're doing. You know that these are practices for our bottom line. I, I will tell you that Google has. Uh, a demonstrated track record of building search engines that meet the needs of consumers here and around the world. We are a trusted brand. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what answer you're uh, looking for, but uh -huh. it's... Well, what I'm looking for is a little honesty, and what I'm also looking for is some accountability. So let me just ask, let me give you another shot at Senator Blumenthal's question. Will you submit to an independent third-party audit about your content moderation practices? Again, we have plenty of people looking at our content moderation yes, practices. Yes no. The Economist just did a year-long study the of our content. Economist is not an independent audit. They're not. It auditors. was entirely independent of Google. So, is that a yes? If you're are happy we, to do if, it for them, if, then you feel if like third parties want to moderate, uh, you'll open your books. Want to? Them? Is that a they yes? they look the at us. Big news we're going to make today. Is this a yes? I, we're getting a yes. No, I'm uh, I'm telling you that Google oh, that Google's content moderation has been looked at by so many sad. Third Let me. So sad. Let me, let me ask you about YouTube, some other difficult decisions. China seems to be difficult for you. YouTube is also apparently very difficult for you. Why isn't it, what is so hard about ending the automatic referral of videos featuring minors to pedophiles? Why is that difficult? Why doesn't YouTube just do it? You, you know you can stop it. Why, why, won't, why won't you just do it? Senator, I'm not sure. Um, we, we, we you're not familiar have, with this issue? No, I'm familiar with the issue that you're referring to. Based on our policy decisions that we've made earlier this year, um, we uh, have eliminated or uh, referencing or, or recommending videos that contain minors in risky situations, risky, risky uh Conditions. Wait, so you're telling me that you've, you've turned off the auto, you've taken them out of the algorithm, you've turned off the auto referral, you're no longer recommending videos I would, with minors? Yes, no, no, not all minors. There will be situations where there's perfectly legitimate video footage containing minors, but um, videos that contain minors in risky situation, risky uh, conditions, we have. Um, uh, stopped recommending those videos. How, how, much, um, how much money does YouTube make from videos featuring children? Um, I, we don't break down money that way, Senator. You don't? You don't know, the, you don't know what it really? Because I thought the response to the New York Times was that it would, not be, it, it, it would be devastating for your business model. I, I don't know uh, you don't, about you that don't. reference. We, we don't. The, I can tell you that the kinds of videos that you're referencing, we uh, don't, we, we have no desire to see pedophiles utilizing YouTube. I wouldn't have thought for, so either. For, and, and that's the reason why we've taken a number of steps. Uh, How about we this? Have, you, support, you may know that I've introduced a bill that would, that would codify this into law. Steps, it sounds like, like the ones you say you voluntarily taken. So will Google support that bill that would, that would stop any company, yours or others, from automatically referring uh, videos featuring minors in this way? I'd be happy to, I haven't looked at the bill, but it would be happy to look at it. And certainly it's an area, it sounds like we have a common interest in working towards a successful outcome. Well, it's certainly an area in which I think the American people have an interest in protecting their children, just as the American people have an interest in getting infor information that is free and fair, just as the American people have an interest in having their data promoted, protected, Absolutely. just as the American people have an interest in having companies that describe themselves as a proudly American company, those are your words, Absolutely. from not doing business with, sharing secrets with, or otherwise promoting the worst, most authoritarian regime on the planet, which is China. So, you know, I'll just associate myself with the remarks of, I think, all of my colleagues here. Clearly, our trust and patience in your company and the behavior of your monopoly has run out. It has certainly run out with me, and I think it's time for some accountability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Uh, Mr. Bautier, you talked about that Google values being a trusted brand. Um, I will tell you, I think that trust has been severely eroded. Uh, Google, as I understand it, was founded on a motto of don't be evil. Um, there are more than a few Americans who have skepticism that Google is living up to that promise. Um, you answered Senator Hawley that, well, gosh, The Economist and others have done studies. Uh, did The Economist have access to Google's internal records? Uh, 
No, Senator, I believe it was done externally. They looked, they ran a series of tests based on results that they were plugging into our search engine. So engines. one of the very frustrating things about this topic is there are very limited data. Much of this topic gets argued by anecdote, which is a less than satisfying way to consider any topic or to consider any analysis, and it yields things such as Democratic senators saying there is no censorship. The problem is Google has all the data, as does Facebook, as does Twitter. Uh, let me, let's, let's see if we can get a little bit of that da data. In the year 2018, how many ads by Republican office holders did Google block? Have any political ads? How many ads by a Republican um, office holder to Google block? I don't have the number off the top of my head. I, I would say the vast majority of ads that get submitted get run. Will you commit to answering that question? We, we'd be happy to come back to you. And I want the same answer. How many ads by Democrats did Google block? How many, vid how many videos by Republican office holders did YouTube block? How many videos by Democratic office holders did YouTube block? Those are objective. Yeah, data. I, on the latter question, I did. We looked into that. There are there were no uh, videos blocked by Republicans or Democrat members of of uh, the Congress. Um, okay, so my understanding actually is one of the members of this committee, uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn, uh, had one of her ads blocked uh, because you deemed it shocking content. What, is is ad, that ads again distinguish ads from videos i thought you divided those two ads we have had both democrats and republicans on occasion be blocked in the case of uh, senator blackburn yes uh, there was an ad that she submitted um it involved uh, one of the people on the ad voicing an obscenity that Although that was bleeped out, is that correct? That violates our policy as well. It was clear what it was, apparently, and that was violated. So we went back, we talked to the senator. So, so, so let me, let, let me say, I, I appreciate your commitment to answer these questions, and I'm going to ask them to you in writing. Mm -hmm. If Google will answer some straightforward questions that provide the data, that may go a long way either to right. exonerating Google or to demonstrating there's a real problem, and, and, and not only on the metric uh, of... Republicans versus Democrats, also on the metric of how many pro-life ads has Google refused to run. We, this committee has heard testimony, for example, that the movie Unplanned, uh, the true story about a former employee of Planned Parenthood, Google refused to run their ads. So that's a question I'd like an answer to. How many pro-life ads did Google refuse to run? And how many pro-choice ads did Google refuse to run? Likewise, how many pro-Israel ads has Google refused to run? How many, how many anti-Israel ads? Um, those data, right now, Google is a black box, and nobody knows. Let me ask another question. What was the average ad rate Google charged the Trump campaign in, in the 2016 campaign? A ad rates, Senator, are set by auction. So okay, Democrats, Republicans, it's, it's entirely based okay, on the, when the, they would want the, to run. There is an average ad rate. That is a number. It would be the average of the rate you charged across the board. And I'm going to ask you in writing, what was the average ad rate that the Trump campaign paid and the Clinton campaign paid? And if those two numbers are roughly equal, that will indicate one thing. If those two numbers are wildly different, that may indicate something else. And right now, it is Google that knows that, and, and as far as I know, nobody else. If I may, again, just on ads specifically, all ads are not the same. In other words, if you are running a banner headline on YouTube, that may be a higher price than a lower, uh, right. less per. I, I, so it's like a matter of going to be fabulous. like for like. That would be fabulous, and you're more than welcome to break it down. The average banner ad rate for the Trump campaign was X, and the average, if there are three, three different types of ads, break it down in whatever category, but compare apples to apples. And if I could also, Senator, we do have all of the advertising spending for all members on our website where we publicize this. There's a, a transparency report that we put out annually on spending by uh, uh, candidates. Um, it's all up there. Welcome to uh, we'll, we'll be happy to point it out to your staff. Now, 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 let me ask you, you know, some have asked, well, gosh, who would possibly think that Google was discriminating against conservative views? It, the senior leadership at Google, does it lean left or does it lean right? Senator, 
senior leadership, that the, the whole team consists of people from a variety of different perspectives, from outside of the United States, from M Mr. American... Mr. Baccia, you're doing something rather remarkable, which is you're ma managing to be less candid than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Mr. Zuckerberg, when he testified before this committee, admitted Silicon Valley is overwhelmingly liberal, and anyone operating in the realm of, of simple reality would acknowledge that. Would you agree with that? Senator, I go back to 100,000 people, 70, 80 different countries, uh, leadership teams pulled from all over the world. Um, I don't think it's an, a matter of easy caricature. The days okay, when okay, we were just let, a let, Silicon let's Valley let's company. Let's focus on, on some simple data. It's where data is helpful. Uh, I did an FEC analysis in 2016 of senior executives at Google, people who had the title of some form of executive, vice president, or director found at least 88 unique senior, senior officials at Google who made contributions to the Hillary Clinton campaign. 88. Do you know how many, how many senior executives at Google made contributions to the Trump campaign? Senator, it's not my business to look into that. C care to field a guess? Zero. Goose egg. Not a single one. This ain't close that you can't say, gosh, I don't know anything about the politics here. Uh, th 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 that is disconnected from reality. Let's look at another example. Senator Blackburn uh, asked about the advisory council that you put together uh, on artificial intelligence. One of the people on that advisory council uh, was Kay Coles James, mm -hmm. who was the head of the Heritage Foundation. Yes, sir. Um, you worked at the Heritage Foundation, I, did. I believe you said. D do you consider the Heritage Foundation some fringe organization? No, Senator, I consider it a conservative organization. So 2,500 Google employees signed a petition to have Ms. James removed from the council, and they said, quote, by appointing James to the ATEAC, Google elevates and endorses her views, implying that hers is a valid perspective worthy of inclusion in its decision-making. This is unacceptable. So you have 2,500 employees at Google saying that Ms. James, who, by the way, is an African-American woman, was one of the first women to desegregate the Richmond public schools. 2,500 Google employees saying that her view is not valid or worthy of inclusion. Google, in response to this, dissolved the entire committee. Do you understand when you see that kind of bias saying a conservative African-American woman's views are not valid and not worthy of inclusion, that the American people would say, these guys are silencing voices they disagree with. Senator, uh, the 2,300 amounts to something around 2% of the Google employees. But Google acted uh, on their recommendation. No, you, Senator. You dissolved did, the committee. We did not, Senator. What happened in that situation was it was a committee that consisted of a number of, uh, of uh, members. Um, as... Uh, time progressed, a number of members of the committee, other than Ms. James, decided to, to, to fall off the committee, to withdraw from the committee. So is it so, your testimony, Mr. Bate, because I'm finding this, this, this difficult to credit, is it your testimony that, you, that Google did not dissolve the committee because your employees were mad that anyone right of center was included? We dissolved the committee, Senator. I think we were clear at the end of the day uh, that, that, that it was not going to be viable to continue the, the, the council given what we were seeing happening with other members of the committee. Um, in a March 18 email to at least 17 other Google employees, uh, Google employee Liam Hot Hopkins stated that, quote, PragerU, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro et al. are all Nazis. This is a quote are using dog whistles. He further suggested that Google isolate this, quote, far-right content. Um, is it your judgment that Mr. Prager, Mr. Peterson, and Mr. Shapiro are Nazis? No, Senator. Um, at least two of the three, Mr. Prager and Mr. Shapiro, are Orthodox Jews. Are you familiar with any Orthodox Jews who are Nazis? No, Senator. Is that not a horrifically offensive, nutty statement. Senator, we have 100,000 people in the company, and there are you know, 
five, seven times the number of people who work in Congress. We have um, people who will say things on so there were, know, chat there rooms were and other things. So there were Google employees that, on that email. Did even one of them object to this characterization? I, I don't know whether they did or not, Senator. We have a lot of these chat rooms that go on. People say things in chat rooms that certainly don't reflect the views of the company. Um, you know, it's, it's not unlike many other workplaces around the world where people may say things that, uh, you know, don't reflect the views of the leadership team and the management where, you know, it is what it is. Do you understand why people would be skeptical of Google's judgment and the radical politics of Google's employees when you believe Orthodox Jews like Mr. Prager and Mr. Shapiro are secretly Nazis? Again, Senator, this is a statement that was made by an individual employee on some chat room board. Google executive Jen Janai was videoed saying that Google is, quote, training its algorithms uh, with an eye to prevent something like 2016 from happening again. Is that what Google is working to do? And here's, here's the quote. We're also training our ag algorithms like if 2016 happened again, would we have, would the outcome uh, be different? So, Senator, this was taken, I believe, from the Project Veritas videos where Ms. Janai was, uh, who is a... Uh, uh, Google employee without uh, responsibility for uh, our search algorithms um, was secretly uh, videotaped without her consent. Um, uh, her reference uh, that you're quoting here and that the video subsequently made was to activities that we have undertaken to make sure that election interference that was seen, foreign state interference in the elections that was seen in 2016 does not happen again. That's what the reference is to. Well, I think one of the best things to come out of this hearing is your commitment to answer the clear and direct questions from this committee with real numbers and specific hard data on Google's practices that will go a long way to providing transparency that has far too long been missing. And let me echo both Senator Blumenthal and Senator Hawley that I would strongly advise Google submit to an independent third party audit that has no bias, that has no ax to grind with access to Google's records. An audit that doesn't have access to the record is meaningless. Your competitors are doing so and I believe the American people expect transparency from all of big tech. Senator Hirono. Yeah. Just for clarification, so um, uh, my understanding is that Google has a very different uh, business model than Twitter or Facebook. So while those entities can agree to a, a third party audit uh, that would include, uh, I guess, content, um, looking into their, their records in a way that, that uh, they can, uh, that, that still enables them to retain their, I don't know, business methods or whatever it is, but you're in a very different kind of category. Is that why you're having such a hard time uh, saying that you would s submit to a third party audit of co your content moderation practices? Well, Senator, we are in a very different space. We're not a social media platform the way uh, you, um, the other companies, Facebook and Twitter you referenced are. We're actually in many different platforms and we have Gmail, we have Android. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different uh, parts to our business. Certainly that adds to the complication. So y you were asked whether, um, regarding your ads, okay, I understand that the, the business model is, uh, is very different. So uh, you were asked whether, you know, you've taken down pro-life, pro-choice, pro-Israel, anti-Israel ads. Do you have an algorithm that actually flags out the, the, these words? No. Or... So no, how would you even be able to respond to a question if your, your algorithms don't even flag out uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, these ads based on these identifying terms? Yeah, we, we, again, we, we are, as I explained before, what we're trying to do is, what we do is create algorithms that try and surface the most responsive results. We don't factor in, you know, whether they contain the word Israel or abortion mm -hmm. or any of the other things. So it's, it's, they're not constructed that way. So Google is a multi-billion dollar business. So regardless of uh, your employees exercising their First Amendment rights to put whatever, um, whatever 
things that they want to put out that you don't even agree with. I mean, Google is a business. Does it even does it make business sense for Google to start doing content moderation that's based on somebody's uh, political affiliations or th their views? Does that even make sense? Absolutely not. And uh, you know, if we if we lose user trust, it will be damaging to our business. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Batia. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate your coming. Uh, the Senate is right now in the midst of three, three votes. So what we're going to do is we're going to briefly recess this committee, go and, and cast those votes. votes. Uh, there are three votes. So we're at the tail end of the first vote. And so we will vote on those three. I will ask members of the committee to vote at the very beginning of the third vote. And as soon as we do so, we will come back and convene the second panel. That, uh, so, but, but for now, the, the committee is temporarily recessed. Thank you. Following a vote break, members return to the second half of a hearing on Google and censorship. Among the witnesses were Andy Parker, father of Allison Parker, who was killed during a live TV broadcast, and Dennis Prager, a conservative commentator who claimed that Google and YouTube sought to restrict or remove his video content. This is an hour and 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I would ask each of the witnesses for the second panel uh, to please uh, take your seats. Uh, apologize for that delay while we went uh, through the three votes we had. Uh, we will now uh, begin the second panel of five witnesses. Uh, each witness will have a five-minute opening statement followed by rounds of questions. Our first witness is Mr. Dennis Prager. Uh, Dennis Prager is a best-selling author, a columnist, and a nationally syndicated radio talk show host. He is also the co-founder of Prager University, an institution of higher learning on the Internet that produces five-minute videos in which experts distill complex topics in political science, history, philosophy, religion, economics, and psychology. Mr. Prager was previously appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the U.S. delegation to the Vienna Review Conference on the Helsinki Accords. He was also appointed by President George W. Bush to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council. Our second witness is Jason Kent. Jason Kent is the CEO of Digital Content Next, a trade association that serves the unique needs of digital content companies. Before joining Digital Content Next in 2014, Mr. Kent served in various executive roles, including as general manager and senior vice president at CBS Interactive, and as the director of Online Publishers Association. He is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. Our third witness is Mr. Andy Parker. Mr. Parker is the father of Allison Parker. In 2015, Allison was tragically shot and killed during a live TV broadcast. Mr. Parker now travels across the country to advocate on gun control issues, and he has been working tirelessly to remove footage of his daughter's murder from YouTube and other internet sites. Mr. Parker recently published a book about his daughter's life and leg legacy entitled For Allison, The Murder of a Young Journalist and a Father's Fight for Gun Safety. Our third witness is Dr. Francesca Tripodi, who is an assistant professor of sociology at James Madison University and an affiliated researcher at Data and Society. Dr. Tripodi's research focuses on how partisan groups interact with the media and the role that community plays in understanding what constitutes news and information. She received a PhD and an MA from the University of Virginia, 
an MA in Communication, Culture, and Technology from Georgetown University, and a BA in Communications from the University of Southern California. Our final witness is Dr. Robert Epstein. Dr. Epstein is the, an author, editor, and longtime psychology researcher and professor. He is currently a senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology, and he is a contributing editor for the Scientific American Mind. He is also the founder and director emeritus of the Cambridge Center for Behavioral Studies in Massachusetts and the former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today. Mr. Prager, we'll start with you. Microphone. Uh, okay. Do I get my 20 You would think back? a radio host would know how you to do it. You would. That. You would. Uh, that is a very fine point. I have no response. Uh, I will take just a moment, because uh, my opening comment is under five minutes, just to respond on the issue of the Ten, Commandment, Ten Commandments video uh, that was uh, placed on the restricted list by Google. The representative from Google mentioned that uh, in a reason that it would be on the restricted list uh, was that uh, it contains mentions of murder. So I was thinking I have a solution that will, I think, appeal to Google. I will re-release it as the Nine Commandments. That should solve uh, the problem of including murder in my discussion of the Ten Commandments. And as regards the swastika, yes, there is a swastika. Uh, it is, again, in the commandment of do not murder, wherein I show that murder, there are people who believe murder is all right even today, and I use the swastika and the, uh, and the hammer and sickle as two examples. I would think we would want young people to associate the swastika with evil. That was why I had a swastika. It is an honor to be invited to speak in the United States Senate, but I wish I were not so honored because the subject of this hearing, Google and YouTube's, and for that matter, Twitter and Facebook's suppression of internet content on ideological grounds, threatens the future of America more than any external enemy. In fact, never in American history has there been as strong a threat to freedom of speech as there is today. Before addressing this, however, I think it important that you know a bit about me and the organization I co-founded, Prager University, Prager U, as it is often referred to. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. My late father, Max Prager, was a CPA and an Orthodox Jew who volunteered to serve in the U.S. Navy at the start of World War II. My father's senior class thesis at the City College of New York was on anti-Semitism in America. Yet despite his keen awareness of the subject, he believed that Jews living in America were the luckiest Jews to have ever lived. He was right. Having taught Jewish history at Brooklyn College, written a book on anti-Semitism, and fought Jew hatred my whole life, I thank God for living in America. It breaks my heart that a vast number of young Americans have not only not been taught how lucky they are to be Americans, but have been taught either how unlucky they are or how ashamed they should be. It breaks my heart for them because contempt for one's country leaves a terrible hole in one's soul and because ungrateful people always become unhappy and angry people. And it breaks my heart for America because no good country can survive when its people have contempt for it. I have been communicating this appreciation of America for 35 years as a radio talk show host, the last 20 in national syndication with the Salem Radio Network, an organization that is a blessing in American life. One reason I started PragerU was to communicate America's moral purpose and moral achievements, both to young Americans and to young people around the world. With a billion views a year, and with more than half of the viewers under age 35, PragerU has achieved some success. My philosophy of life is easily summarized. God wants us to be good, period. God without goodness is fanaticism, and goodness without God will not long endure. 
Everything I and PragerU do emanates from belief in the importance of being a good person. That some label us extreme or quote haters only reflects on the character and the broken moral compass of those making such accusations. They are the haters and extremists. PragerU releases a five minute video every week. Our presenters include three former prime ministers, four Pulitzer Prize winners, liberals, conservatives, gays, blacks, Latinos, atheists, believers, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and professors and scientists from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and a dozen other universities. Do you think the Secretary General of NATO or the former prime ministers of Norway, Canada, or Spain, or the late Charles Krauthammer, or Philip Hamburger, distinguished professor of law at Columbia Law School, would make a video for an extreme or hate-filled site? The idea is not only preposterous, it is a smear. Yet Google, which owns YouTube, has restricted access to 56 of our 325-minute videos and to other videos we produce. Restricted means families that have a filter to avoid pornography and violence cannot see that video. It also means that no school or library can show that video. Google has even restricted access to a video on the Ten Commandments, as we have seen. Yes, the Ten Commandments. We have repeatedly asked Google why our videos are restricted. No explanation is ever given. But of course we know why, because they come from a conservative perspective. Liberals and conservatives differ on many issues, but they have always agreed that free speech must be preserved. While the left has never supported free speech, liberals always have. I therefore appeal to liberals to join us in fighting on behalf of America's crowning glory, free speech. Otherwise, I promise you, one day you will say, first they came after conservatives, and I said nothing. And then they came after me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prager. Mr. Kent. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Senator Cruz, Ranking Member Hirono, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am the CEO of Digital Content Next, and I'm here to speak on behalf of high-quality digital publishers. DCN is the only association exclusively focused on the future of publishing. Our members include some of the most trusted brands on the web, hundreds of them, large and small, old and new, from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times, Disney, Warner Media, NBC, and Fox, to native digital publishers like The Insider and IJR in the Texas Tribune. I was invited here today to specifically address Google, a company which reaches billions of people across its platforms on which it determines the rules and limits access to its massive data pool. At the same time, Google leverages this data to compete against those who depend on its platforms. The web was supposed to be competitive and open, but it simply lost much of that vision as Google's dominance has grown. Google is the primary gatekeeper to any digital content business in four ways, which I'll cover today. I'll call them the four Ds. Discovery and design of the content, and then the data and the dollars that come from consuming the content. First, discovery. Prior to my move to Washington, I spent over 20 years running digital media businesses. Like publishers today, we had entire teams focused on optimizing content for the maximum clicks from Google Search, as it controls more than 90% of the search market. Over time, Google has pushed search results off the first screen in favor of more lucrative Google ads and Google's own properties. Second, design. Google, more than any company, influences the design of our members' content. Google's web browser, Chrome, is responsible for more than 60% of the traffic on the web. Therefore, publishers design their websites to work best inside of Google's browser. With the, with the increase of mobile device usage, Google even developed its own code for the mobile web, which promises even better search results for the publishers who choose to adopt it, furthering their grip on the web. Third, data. Today, personal data is collected and used to micro-target users across the web as cheaply as possible. 
our industry's opaque data-driven ecosystem has mostly benefited intermediaries, primarily Google, at the expense of publishers and advertisers. Last month, for the first time, we saw empirical research that demonstrated this. Google's revenue concentration ties directly to its ability to collect, da to collect data in ways that no one else can. It's important to understand that Google owns the top five domains on the web that track us on more than 75% of the top one million websites. They see much of what we do. Data is the source of Google's power and they leverage it to the hilt. With this in mind, the industry's rules around privacy and data are heavily determined by Google's best interests. Legal teams at publishers are forced to adopt Google's rules or choose not to do business with Google. In other words, there is no choice. Finally and fourth, the dollars. We've been on record since 2015 describing the duopoly of digital advertising, where almost all of the incremental growth in our industry is going to Google and Facebook. But in the case of Google, it has cornered the advertising server market. On the supply side, advertising teams are optimizing for Google's ad server and the often opaque business rules and measurements that Google establishes. And on the demand side, because Google oversees more advertising demand than any of the top five advertising agencies, Google is able to, in effect, set the prices of ads in the auction markets. Google determines the rules of their auctions with full knowledge whether or not they will help Google or they will help publishers. It can't be both. To make matters worse, all of these products hinge on Google's algorithms, which are shrouded in a proprietary black box of secrecy, which absorbs most of the data across the web and spits out profits according to how Google decides to tune them. In closing, I want to thank Chairman Cruz and Ranking Member Hirono for convening today's hearing. From my perspective, it's abundantly clear that Google dominates the digital landscape and uses that dominance to enhance its own bottom line to the detriment of the marketplace and most importantly, consumers. In the absence of meaningful competition or constraints, the question we as a society must be asking ourselves is whether we're comfortable with the world that Google is creating for us. It is time to end Google's stranglehold on digital media. I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Mr. Parker. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hirano and Senator Blackburn, thank you all for hearing my testimony today. In August 2015, my daughter, journalist Allison Parker, was shot and murdered while reporting on live television. The unimaginable pain felt by my family was amplified after the killer uploaded a first-person video of the murder to YouTube. I pledged to honor my daughter's memory and advocate for sensible gun laws so that others wouldn't suffer the same fate as Allison. In response to my advocacy, countless people have targeted me, my family, and Allison's boyfriend online, claiming that Allison's death was part of a conspiracy to seize their guns. They have taken the gruesome footage of my daughter's murder, edited it into videos and flooded YouTube and other social media platforms with hate-filled diatribes maligning us. As the company with a virtual monopoly on internet search and online video hosting, Google has a duty to make sure the information they make accessible to the world is based on facts and not harmful conspiracy theories. I implored Google and YouTube to take down the footage of her murder and the related conspiratorial con content. Their response was to suggest that I view and flag the content I found offensive. Instead of self-policing, they put the onus on me. In essence, they wanted me to watch my daughter's murder and explain to a robot why it should be removed. I never have. Nor, ever, nor will I ever watch any of it for obvious reasons. So in 2017, I reached out to Lenny Posner, whose son Noah was murdered in, Sandy, in the Sandy Hook shooting, and the Honor Network, who worked long hours flagging videos so, so that I was spared. Although hundreds of videos have been taken down due to their diligence, they are often stymied with, even, even with an enforceable copyright. I've engaged in direct communications with Google regarding the proliferation of these videos, but while they profess a desire to help, in reality, they do nothing. On May 1st of this year, 
in the company of Georgetown University Civil Rights Law Clinic, I had a video conference, conference with representatives from Google regarding specific content and our attempts to have it removed. Their response was, we're really trying. Since that meeting, there has been nothing but silence until coincidentally, coincidentally not so, but today, we got an email from them at 9.47 a.m. Thanks to Section 230, Google has complete immunity and therefore no incentive to respond. And you saw some of the examples earlier. In an utter fail, failure of their AI, one video was self-flagged by Google, then later the flag was removed. Some videos were not removed and instead given this uh, label, this video may be inappropriate for some users. That was also uh, shown today, which is tantamount to a perverse invitation to click and watch. The video has had over 700,000 views and was still, and was specifically pointed out to Google in our teleconference, and it's still up as we speak. I understand that the general purpose of this hearing is to consider whether internet gatekeepers such as Google should or should not censor the speech of the politically unpopular. However, it is important to note that turning a blind eye to targeted harassment over the internet in the name of preserving free speech has real world and life altering consequences. Furthermore, this harassment itself is, has a significant chilling effect on free speech and public advocacy of the people these conspiracy theorists target. Even though some on this committee may not agree with my cause, they must recognize that the harassment and threats of violence I faced was an attempt to int intimidate me, prevent me from telling Allison's story and speaking out against gun violence, and to silence my free speech rights. I recognize the First Amendment gives everyone the right to publicly speculate that the moon landing didn't happen or that the earth is flat. But there's a difference between someone venting about a favorite conspiracy theory and Google turning its platforms over to anonymous users for them to target and harass victims of public tragedies. The former is free speech. The latter is violence. As more and more public tragedies and horrific mass shootings occur, they will be recorded, broadcasted, and disseminated on platforms like YouTube, like so much cheap entertainment for Google to use to add a few more millions to their bottom line. Google pr profits massively off of lack of reg regulation. If it cannot properly protect citizens from online harassment, hate speech, and moment of death videos, I call on Congress to step in and make sure these that proper protections are in place for private citizens like me who are continually harassed and exploited. Currently, platforms like Google are protected against civil or criminal liability under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Removing the Section 230 protection will allow users to hold Google responsible for the conspir conspiratorial content it allows on its platforms. Mr. Chairman, there may not be a lot of issues that you and I agree on, philosophically that is, but we do agree on this. We should protect the First Amendment, but it's time for Google and social media to be regulated. It's the original founders, as you mentioned earlier, uh, had a motto, their original motto was, don't be evil. This motto was replaced in 2015 by, do the right thing. Google fails miserably on both counts. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Parker, and thank you for sharing your powerful story and, and your powerful testament to your daughter. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tripodi. Good evening. It is an honor to return before the Senate committee to discuss my research. During the last hearing and today, conservatives have claimed that Google is biased. Scholars, such as Dr. Epstein, argue that this bias has the capacity to sway elections. My research also confirms that people trust algorithmic output. But where we differ is that my research demonstrates that the phrases we choose are encoded with bias before they hit the browser. Epistemological frameworks shape what we will search for, how, and why. And simple shifts in syntax dramatically change what Google will return to us. For example, 
In the fall of 2017, if one were to Google NFL ratings down, all of the top returns supported President Trump's claims that the anthem protests hurt NFL ratings. However, if you searched NFL ratings up, Google returned entirely different headlines, supporting the opposite position. When you Google for information about conservative censorship, the top returns are conservative news that support this claim. Google the phrase PragerU and you get their website, their Twitter account, their YouTube channel, and their Wikipedia page. Those interested in learning more from conservative thinkers have ample access to do so. My data show that users shape our own realities because we teach Google what we want to see based on the keywords that we enter. My findings also indicate that the process of matching keywords to content can be gamed to maximize exposure. For example, the phrase AOC returns conservative videos on YouTube, even though this is the Twitter handle of Representative Ocasio-Cortez. This matching is not accidental. By partnering with a data scientist, I have obtained and analyzed the metadata of 13 different YouTube channels, including thousands of videos. And in this data, you can see that Fox News is 6.7 times more likely to use AOC as a search engine optimization tag than MSNBC, thereby increasing the probability that searching for the phrase will link audiences to conservative news coverage of a liberal politician. YouTube has a vested interest in keeping people on the site for as long as possible and intentionally feeds audiences content they can't stop watching. Producers also want to commodify their content to maximize exposure. And conservative channels cross-promote guests and ideas in order to feed these algorithmic connections. Now, as a marketing strategy, this is not nefarious. But because they also host far-right thinkers and provide them a platform to validate their opinions, it amplifies those ideas as well. That is because YouTube is a social media network of content creators, featured guests, as well as users who comment, like, or share the videos. Freedom of speech is one of the fundamental rights designed by our forefathers. It is crucial for allowing Americans to express both widely accepted and unpopular opinions without fear of government punishment or censorship. However, privately held corporations like Facebook, Google, and Twitter are not the new public square. They are sophisticated advertising firms designed to profit from the data we provide to them. They are also spaces where people can create mass followings. And those who want to profit from YouTube must adhere to their terms of service. These terms are not written to disenfranchise, to disenfranchise conservatives. These policies were created in the interest of safeguarding members of protected groups and are designed to reduce hatred, harassment, discrimination, and violence. In sum, what we get from Google depends primarily on what we search. And depending on what you search, conservatism thrives online. For progressive nonprofits, Conservative media are the Goliaths, well-funded companies with large production budgets and sophisticated digital marketing campaigns. This is why YouTube's top returns for phrases like gender identity or social justice are conservative videos. Click on these videos and YouTube doesn't try to steer the audience left. It autoplays a steady stream of conservative ideas. Simply put, if content is readily available, it is not being suppressed. What conservatives who are arguing censorship are frustrated with is not the constitutional right to free speech, but is actually a grievance against a free market economy. The right for everyone to speak their ideas does not guarantee the right to captivate a large audience, nor the right to profit from them. Given how YouTube tries to keep audiences on their platform, I think we can all agree that a more pressing issue for this committee to pay attention to is how metadata can amplify hate speech, pedophilia, conspiracy theories, and disinformation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Epstein.
please, please turn your microphone on. I am indeed Dr. Robert Epstein. The most important thing for you to know about me is that I'm the father of five wonderful children. As it happens, I'm also a research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. I have been center, center left my whole adult life, but I value my country and democracy more than I value any party or candidate. That is why I'm speaking out today. I'm here to explain why Google poses a serious threat to democracy, how monitoring systems can protect us from companies like Google, and how Congress can immediately end Google's worldwide monopoly on search. My plan for ending that monopoly was published just yesterday in Business Week. I respectfully request that my article be entered into the congressional record. It's attached to my full testimony. Uh, it will be entered without objection. I've been a research psychologist for nearly 40 years. My PhD is from Harvard, and since 1981, I've published extensively on AI and other topics. Some of my research has focused on Google, on the company's massive surveillance operations, censorship capabilities, and unprecedented ability to manipulate the thinking of 2.5 billion people, soon to be four plus billion. I've written article, articles about Google for Time Magazine, USA Today, that kind of thing, but also for The Daily Caller and even Russia's Sputnik News. I reach out to diverse audiences because I believe the threats posed by Google, and to a lesser extent Facebook, are so serious that everyone needs to know about them. Here are just three disturbing findings from my research which adheres to the very highest standards of scientific integrity. Number one, in 2016, Google's search algorithm likely impacted undecided voters in a way that shifted at least 2.6 million votes to Hillary Clinton, whom I supported. I know this because I preserved more than 13,000 election-related searches prior to Election Day, and Google's search results were significantly biased in favor of Secretary Clinton. I know the number of votes that shifted because I've conducted dozens of controlled experiments that measure how opinions shift when search results are biased. I call this shift SEAM, the Search Engine Manipulation Effect, which I first published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015. Biased search results can easily produce shifts in the opinions and voting preferences of undecided voters by up to 80% in some demographic groups because people blindly trust high-ranking search results over lower ones. SEAM is an especially dangerous form of influence because it is, in effect, subliminal. It also leaves no paper trail for authorities to trace. It's an example of a short-lived or, quote, ephemeral experience. That's a phrase you'll find in internal emails that have leaked recently from Google. I'm now studying seven such manipulations, like SEAM, and unlike billboards or those Russian-placed ads, these manipulations are invisible and non-competitive. They're controlled entirely by big tech companies, and there is no way to counteract them. Number two, on election day in 2018, the Go Vote reminder that Google displayed on its home page gave one political party at least 800,000 more votes than it gave the other party. That reminder was not a public service. It was a vote manipulation. Number three, in the weeks leading up to the 2018 election, bias in Google search results may have shifted upwards of 78.2 million votes spread across many races to the candidates of one political party. This number is based on bias in data captured by my 2018 monitoring system, which preserved more than 47,000 election-related searches conducted by a diverse group of American voters. I know how to stop big tech in its tracks, and that brings me briefly here to monitoring systems and the proposal I published yesterday. A 2015 phone call from the Attorney General of Mississippi prompted me to start a years-long project in which I have learned how to capture online ephemeral experiences. 
In early 2016, I deployed a system that allowed my team to look over people's shoulders as they conducted online searches with their permission. I deployed a more sophisticated system in 2018, and I'm raising funds now to build a much more comprehens comprehensive system in 2020, one that will allow us to catch big tech in the act to instantly spot when Facebook is biasing news feeds or when Twitter is suppressing tweets sent by Ann Coulter or Elizabeth Warren. This system must be built to keep an eye on big tech in 2020 because if these companies all support the same candidate, they will have the power to shift 15 million votes to that candidate. To let big tech get away with subliminal manipulation on this scale would be to make the free and fair election meaningless. Finally, regarding yesterday's article, Congress can quickly end Google's worldwide monopoly on search by declaring Google's massive search index, the database the company uses to generate search results, to be a public commons, accessible, accessible by all, just as a 1956 consent decree forced AT&T to share all its patents. There is precedent in both law and Google's business practices to justify taking this step, which will make online search competitive again and dramatically diminish Google's power worldwide. In 1961, Eisenhower warned about the possible rise of a technological elite that would control public policy without people's awareness. That elite now exists, and you must determine where we go from here. Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Hirono, Mrs. Blackburn, other members of the committee, democracy as originally conceived cannot survive big tech as currently empowered. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for that fascinating testimony. Um, Senator Blackburn has asked that she might go earlier, so I'll yield my time to her and I'll ask my questions uh, later in this round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. We've got a telephone town hall with Tennesseans. And I, but I did not want to miss hearing your testimony because I think this is a tremendously important topic. And one that Congress, time has arrived for Congress to take some action and to focus on appropriate light touch regulation to hold big tech responsible. And Mr. Epstein, Dr. Epstein, I agree with you. They are manipulators. It is not lost on me that Mark Zuckerberg at one point said Facebook worked more like a government than a corporation, and it is a very manipulative one. And uh, Dr. Tripodi, I, I will tell you, I agree with you too. They're nothing but big advertising companies, and you know their business model is pretty much built on greed. And Mr. Parker, I will say uh, my heart breaks for you. I very much remember, very vividly remember, uh, seeing that footage with Allison. And I can only imagine, as a mom and a grandmom, I can only imagine what you and your family have lived through. And so I thank you for your courage in speaking up. Mr. Kent, uh, I will say to you, privacy uh, is important, and I think probably it is time that we do something on privacy. I have had the Browser Act. I introduced that when I was in the House. Uh, it is light touch regulation, but what it does is to give the consumer the opportunity to own, as I call it, their virtual you, which is you in your presence online gives you control over that. And I think this body would be well advised to move forward with legislation such as that. Um, Mr. Prager, I um, have been to your website, know your work, and I share your frustration with Google and YouTube. And I know that you filed a lawsuit against both companies in 2017. And I feel for you in sharing your frustration. As you probably know, uh, I have borne the worst of Google's culture, their corporate culture, and their employees' political bias. And yes, indeed, uh, Dr. Tripodi, you and I could have a good discussion about this, but they do bring that bias to work 
and it does inform those algorithms. And one of their senior engineers actually singled me out for my political views and then doubled down on that. And then Google came along and refused to put up an ad from the Tennessee Republican Party in support of my campaign. So is there bias? Yes. Have I experienced firsthand? Yes, I have. And, um, but Mr. Prager, I've got just a couple of questions before we move on, and I want to go through these quickly. How did Google and YouTube censorship harm your ability to communicate your message online? Well, it's, uh, it's fairly evident if, if things cannot be seen by any family that restricts pornography and violence, if no school can see it, by definition, if it's on the restricted list, if no library can show it, that's, that's a very serious restriction, especially given that our target audience is young people. So they're depriving us of the, of the very people that we most want to touch with our message. So that's pretty dramatic. And, this and so how did your viewership go down after they restricted you? Well, I can't give you a number, obviously. There's no way of knowing what number of people are in homes that have already, already have filters and don't even therefore know about a video because it just can't be accessed. Uh, we know that many teachers try to show our videos in classes and they come up, uh, they can do it on their own, but they can't do it through the school. What explanation has Google given you That's, for the research? Well, you, you used the great word frustration. <laughs> we have gotten none. And actually, it's almost unbelievable because if you look at the list, and, and, and like the Ten Commandments being a perfect example of, of how people will go, you've got to be kidding. Well, I finally found out today, you did. We all heard. The representative of Google told us why the Ten Commandments video was taken down, because it contains murder. So, as I said, we have a solution. We'll put up one without thou shalt not murder in it. But it, it, it is, that's so absurd as to be hilarious. This, is, this will be something I will replay on my radio show for years. It, 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 that is the level of absurdity. I feel like I'm in a Monty Python skit here uh, w when he says something like that. The, the only possible explanation for all of this is they don't like PragerU because we're a very, very influential conservative voice touching a lot of lives. There is no other explanation. I thank you all. My time's expired, but thank you for your attention to the issue. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for the focus on, on this. I yield my time. Thank you. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Parker, of course, you have all of our uh, sympathies and empathies for all that you've been going through. Uh, you did hear the Google uh, witness say that they are proactively uh, eliminating the, these, this kind of content. Um, and you said, though, that uh, I think you testified that they're doing nothing. They've done nothing. Uh, that's yes. And, and that is correct. And, and his testimony was not accurate at all. They are not doing anything. Uh, they continue to. I mean, you heard a lot of uh, uh, responses from from him today that tap danced around your questions. It's similar to what I've experienced over the last two and a half years. So, uh, Mr. Parker, then, uh, is it still all on you, basically, and, and, and you have hired someone to help you uh, because it's an engineer to help, uh, who specializes in AI to help track down copies of the Well, video? I haven't, I've gotten, thankfully, volunteers. Um, there's a gentleman here that's uh, an engineer, Eric Feinberg, who's flagged a lot of these videos. Lenny Posner, again, has and, and, his, and his group have flagged videos. But essentially, yeah, the, the onus is still on me um, and, and the, the people that, and the volunteers to, to take this stuff down. Okay. And when they do self, um, when they do quote unquote self flag something, uh, there was one that literally it, it was flagged to be taken down. And then two days, two or three days later, it was back up again. I think in, in listening to both uh, your perspective and, and that of the Google uh, witness, uh, there's obviously not a meeting of the minds, and I think uh, that it bears further inquiry on, um, at least on my part. I understand that the TV station 
that was involved has given mm -hmm. you the copyright to the video in order yes. to assist your efforts. So why was it necessary for you to resort to claiming copyright infringement? Uh, don't the YouTube community guidelines already prohibit violent or graphic content? They do, but that was a, 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 another avenue for us to say, well, wait a minute, if you're not going to remove violent content and, and moment of death, that was, you know, they have a certificate that you apply to these videos that say, says, if you apply the moment of death video or certificate, then we take it down, except that they don't. They, it's, it's what they've done is purely ad hoc, arbitrary, random. It, there's no rhyme or reason to it. So that was one avenue to, you know, if, if we can't get them to, to flag content, then we'll, you know, we'll go after them for, for copyright infringement. We own the digital rights to this, and they ignore that too, again, because they can. So the, the basis of this hearing is that, that uh, uh, the chairman is trying to show that, that these platforms uh, figure out a way to just take out conservative content. That is not your Question. That's not my issue. That is, that is not your right. Issue and at I all. think it's 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 a much more I mean, not that this isn't important, your issue isn't important, but you know, the fact that they're showing murder and execution on on you know, on the web. Um, you know, Section two thirty was my understanding is that, that uh it had been addressed but uh with child pornography and there was some legislation on that. And I think if we can take I would implore this committee and, and Congress to take at least address a narrow issue with this, similar to that to that precedent, and and say you can't show this stuff. Um, so are are you suggesting that Section 230, the uh, exceptions to the, the uh, immunity from liability, be yes. expanded? Possibly that we should absolutely consider, yes. Consider that. So for Dr. Chipotle. I think you know it's very clear that from the examples you gave that the inquiry that would that you put in can come up with totally different results. So um, I have to say that um, that when we're told that when search results are biased, but the results are not biased, it's it's what's what you're asking uh, that results in uh, the the uh, whatever information you get. So. There's a lot of stuff on all of these platforms. And this past summer, President Trump tweeted that Google rigs its search results in favor of supposedly liberal, liberal, I'm sorry, in favor of liberal news outlets. But you testified that uh, the results depend on what inquiry you put in. So you can put in a totally innocuous kind of result and get a lot of what would be called conservative content. So based on your research, does Google rig its search results against conservatives? So based on my research, I don't look specifically at rigging uh, within my research, but I look at how algorithms are working. And so algorithms are a product of both the input plus the output. And for me, and what my research demonstrates is that the input, which is largely driven by the user, does determine the kind of output that you're going to receive. Yeah. So uh, I think that's why, uh, to show that there, there's, there's an actual bias in, in how they uh, moderate the content uh, uh, issues, it's not so easy. Uh, not to mention that I think I should, you know, it was, I, I showed in the draft, or the graph rather, the, uh, the chart that I showed that actually there seems to be a lot more uh, content that's put in the restrictive mode, not of of PragerU, but of these other entities that are deemed a lot more liberal. So I'm really not understanding Mr. Prager's concerns. Before I end, Mr. Chairman, I would like to get unanimous consent to enter the following into the record. A report titled, Searching for Alternative Facts, Analyzing Scriptural Inter Inference and Conservative News Practices, written by Dr. Tripodi. Without, object Without objection. An article entitled "No Big Tech is Big Tech." Sorry, isn't silencing conservatism? Also written by Dr. Chipotle. Without objection. And I ask for unanimous consent to enter the following statements into the record: the statement of Steve Del Bianco of Net Choice. 
all, all of the statements. Okay, thank you. And the statement of uh, Baron Zoka of Tech Freedom and the statement of Kaylee. Caleb Watney of R Street. And then I finally asked for unanimous consent to enter into the record an editorial that ran in the Washington Post on July 13th titled, How Congress Can Destroy Social Media. All of those will be Thank you, Mr. Record. Chairman. Thank you to each of the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Parker, I want to thank you again for, for sharing your story and your daughter's story. Um, and, and I will say I very much agree with you that you ought to be able to sue the heck out of Google and YouTube. Yep. And if anybody else other than big tech did what they have done to you, if any other citizen delivered a VHS tape of the murder of your daughter to you and your neighbors, you would have a common law tort for intentional infliction of emotional distress, and you could recover very significant damages. There is one group in the United States that is allowed to do what it's doing to you, and that is big tech, because Congress has given them a special subsidy, an immunity from liability, so they don't bear the consequences of their actions. Uh, and I think this hearing has underscored the need for Congress to revisit that. And I hope you will do so, sir. As do I. Uh, Mr. Prager, you described YouTube restricting various uh, videos, I guess a total of, I believe it is, 56 videos produced by Prager University uh, on topics like the Ten Commandments. Another topic, as I understand it, that was restricted uh, was one in which noted liberal, Professor Alan Dershowitz, who was a professor of mine in law school, uh, did a video for you, a historical account of Israel's founding. And, and as I understand it, YouTube restricted that video as well. Does YouTube ever explain why it is restricting these videos? It explains nothing. <laughs> it explains nothing. Uh, this was the first explanation I heard, the incorporation of murder into the Ten Commandments. With regard to Professor... I think we would want young people... We, we would. We hearing would. thou uh, shalt I, not murder. That, I that, that seems admit, like a really good... It was an argument for the alternative universe uh, at that moment for me. I had never accepted the possibility of one, but I agree with you. One would think that that is exactly what young people should hear. Mur God doesn't want you to murder. But so be it. As regards Professor Dershowitz and the video on Israel's founding, we, uh, we have 320 videos, 15 of them concern Israel, and half of them have at one time or another been restricted. There is clearly a, a, a loathing of Israel at Google, I, I suspect there is a loathing of America as well. Virtually every uh, video that we have put out that depicts America in a favorable way is, has also been at some time or another on the restricted list. My favorite example for years was Victor Davis Hanson, this remarkable professor of classics. And he, he made a video. He's one of the most uh, calm speaking humans I have ever met. He's the opposite of, of, of a grenade-throwing speaker. And the subject was the Korean War. The Korean War in five minutes. And it is no longer on the restricted. They go in and out, apparently, uh, in some cases. And that was on the restricted list. because. Uh, I, so I try to think, why would that be? And I, I could only come up with the fact that it shows how noble America's cause in, in, Korea, in Korea was. That 37,000 Americans died to keep half of the Korean Peninsula free. How many people even know that? The Korean War is, 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 it, is, is in the, the, the rubbish bin of history, so, as, as Lenin used to put it. It's, it's just unknown. So we want people to be proud of America, not proud of its evils. Of course America's had evils because it's composed of people and people do evil. But it's largely been extraordinarily good and they don't want us to depict that. And, and Mr. Prager, could you describe what the effect is uh, when a video is placed on the restricted list? We heard the representative from Google say, oh, it's no big deal, it's just 2%. You should be just fine with it. What is, what is the effect of Google arbitrarily? Well, as I explained earlier, it can't, it can't be seen by vast numbers of parents have filters, totally understandably, given how much junk is on the, on the, on the internet. So we're, we're, this is what's so, uh, very important, it not only hurts us in that that family can't see that video, it hurts us because then it is a statement f by Google that Prager University produces videos on the moral level of pornography. 
I mean, that's a, that's a, a, and, and there's no appeal. There's no remedy when no, no, there is no. arbitrary power. We have actually spoken to representatives of theirs that after they say algorithm, if we actually get someone on the phone, we have had humans review it at Google and keep it up. Why? That's uh, uh, community standards. Your video violated community standards. Well, how exactly does the founding of Israel by a Harvard law professor violate community standards? It just does. You know, I have to say it reminds me of the, the, the famous adage about the Supreme Court. Uh, we are not infallible because we are final, uh, uh, but rather we, we, we are... Uh, we are not final because we are infallible, but rather we are infallible because we are final. And, and that, that appears to be the same approach at Google. Um, Dr. Epstein, I, I found your testimony incredibly powerful and incredibly concerning. And, and if anyone draws news out of this hearing, I would encourage you to review very carefully Dr. Epstein's testimony. And I'd like to take a moment to make clear several things. First of all, as I understand your background, uh, you're not a Republican, and, and, and nor are you a conservative. Is that accurate? <clears throat> that would be an understatement. Um, and, in, and indeed, you're the former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today. Correct. So you're a respected academic. You testified before this committee that Google's manipulation of votes gave at least 2.6 million additional votes to Hillary Clinton in the year 2016. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and I want to make sure I understand, you personally supported and voted for Hillary Clinton. I was a very strong public supporter of Hillary Clinton, yes. So you're not dis dismayed that people voted for her, but your testimony is that Google is through bias in search results, manipulating voters in a way they're not aware of? On a massive scale, and what I'm saying is that I believe in democracy, I believe in the free and fair election, uh, more than I have any kind of allegiance to a candidate or a party. And, and looking forward, if I understood your testimony correctly, you said in subsequent elections, Google and Facebook and Twitter and big text manipulation could manipulate as many as 15 million votes in a subsequent election? In 2020, if all these companies are supporting the same candidate, there are 15 million votes on the line that can be shifted without people's knowledge and without leaving a paper trail for authorities to trace. Now, now you described the go vote reminder, and you said it wasn't a public service announcement, but rather manipulation. Can you explain how? I'm not sure everyone followed the details of that. Well, sure. Um, if on election day in 2016, if Mark Zuckerberg, for example, had chosen to send out a go vote reminder, say just to Democrats, and no one would have known if he had done this, that would have given that day an additional at least 450,000 votes to Democrats. And we know this without doubt because of Facebook's own published data because they did an experiment that they didn't tell anyone about during the 2010 election. They published it in 2012. It had 60 million Facebook users involved. They sent out a go vote reminder, and they got something like 360,000 more people to get off their sofas and go vote who otherwise would have stayed home. The point is, I don't think that Mr. Zuckerberg sent out that reminder uh, in 2016. I think he was overconfident. I think Google, Google was overconfident. They, all these companies were. Uh, I don't think he sent that out. Without monitoring systems in place, we'll never know what these companies are doing. But the point is, in 2018, I'm sure they were more aggressive. We have lots of data to support that. And in 2020, you can bet that all of these companies are going to go all out and the methods that they're using are invisible. They're subliminal. They're more powerful than most any effects I've ever seen in the behavioral sciences. And I've been in the behavioral sciences for almost 40 years. You know, our Democratic colleagues on this committee often talk about what they view as the pernicious effect of big money and big corporate dollars. Uh, what you are testifying to is that a handful of Silicon Valley billionaires and giant corporations 
are able to spend millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars collectively, massively influencing the results of elections. And there's no accountability. You said, we don't know. We have no way of knowing if Google or Facebook or Twitter sends it sends its Democrats or Republicans or how they bias it because it's a black box with, 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 with no transparency or accountability whatsoever. I mean, am I understanding <clears throat> you correctly? Senator, with respect, I must correct you. Please. If Mark Zuckerberg chooses to send out a go vote reminder just to Democrats on election day, that doesn't cost him a dime. Fair enough. Um, do you happen to know who the Hillary Clinton campaign's number one financial supporter was in the year 2016? Uh, I think I do, but please remind me. The, the number one financial supporter of the Hillary Clinton campaign in the 2016 election was the parent company of Google, Alphabet, oh, yeah. who was our first witness. They were her number one financial donor, and your testimony is, through their deceptive search methods, they moved 2.6 million votes in her direction. I would think anybody, whether or not you favor one candidate or another, should be deeply dismayed about a handful of Silicon Valley billionaires having that much power over our elections to silently and deceptively shift vote outcomes. Again, with respect, I must correct you. The 2.6 million is a rock bottom minimum. Oh. The range is between 2.6 and 10.4 million, depending on how aggressively they used the techniques that I've been studying now for six and a half years. Wow, could, could you just say that again, please? Just the 2.6 million is a rock bottom minimum. The range is between 2.6 and 10.4 million votes, depending on how aggressive they were in using the techniques that I've been studying, such as the search engine manipulation effect, the search suggestion effect, uh, the answer bot effect, and a number of others. They control these and no one can counteract them. These are not competitive. These are tools that they have at their disposal exclusively. If any head headline comes out of this hearing, that should be it. Senator Hirono. I have just one clarifying question for uh, Dr. Chipotle. So uh, we've heard from Dr. Epstein, uh, and he has published research that uh, substantiates what he says, although I haven't, uh, th th there is a question as to whether or not he used all of the results that actually uh, he should have used. But are you familiar with, with his methodology? Yes. Do you agree with Dr. Epstein's conclusions? I would say we would come to different conclusions, but I'm not sure because we do not know what are the search terms that were used in this study. So I read at length the testimony as well as the reports that he has submitted. And based on what I see, um, and we can go through it together, but there's a couple things that draw out to me. Um, one, it, when they, we run through how the experimental studies were run, it seems that people were given in advance which search terms to study, to, to search. And as far as my research demonstrates that different search terms will yield different kinds of results. Well, that, that is your, the whole point of what your testimony is from what I gather. You can get all kinds of results based on what your inquiry is. And if people actually got the, if they were told what's, uh, what in inquiry to put in, I think you're gonna get different kind of results. And Senator, excuse me, just for a second. Um, these are very simple shifts in syntax that have very different ideological bases. So something like gun rights versus gun control have different ideological positions encoded into them. Senator, may I reply br briefly? Yeah. Yes, well, we're well aware of that. So obviously, uh, we started with more than 500 terms. We narrowed it down to 250, and we had those rated by independent raters. We only used search terms that were not biased in one direction or another. And again, that's based on ratings by independent raters. We're, we're acutely aware of these kinds of issues, and we control for them. Are you going to possibly undertake a study of uh, how Russia's interference with our elections, uh, what kind of impact that had? Are you embarking on that study? We've looked into okay. that, Senator. Uh, I'm very interested in it. I think it's reprehensible. 
uh, that this kinds of thing this kind of thing happens. But um, in fact, Russia was using uh, several techniques, but mainly targeted ads and. The problem there is they're now in a, in a world in an environment that's highly, highly, highly competitive. People also can see ads, so they can, you know, use their judgment and uh, confirmation bias plays a role in how they react to ads. And uh, study you did that, that you talked about probably has all those kinds of factors as uh, as being uh, um, complicating the picture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Epstein, uh, Senator Hirono uh, questioned your methodology and, and, and also said that uh, there were similar problems with search results as there are with ads. I, I want to give you a full opportunity simply to, to respond to those criticisms and, and explain the methodology you used. Uh, well, sure, ads um, and fake news stories for that matter, they're visible and they're competitive. So there have always been those kinds of manipulations. Go back 100 years, there have always been fake ads. Uh, there have always been fake news stories. Uh, and they're competitive. That's a competitive environment. You put up your, your billboard, I put up my billboard. The problem with the techniques that I've been discovering uh, and quantifying is that they're brand new. Uh, the internet has made them possible. They've never been possible before in human history. And they're controlled entirely and exclusively by Google and to a lesser extent Facebook. They're brand new. They, I had, I've had to put names on them one by one as I've discovered them because they're so bizarre. One quick example, we've shown in our experiments uh, that just by manipulating search suggestions, those phrases that are flashed at you when you're typing in a search term, we can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they have been manipulated. We have reason to believe... Can you, can you put some specificity on that? I don't know if that example can be fleshed out, but... Well, yes, in fact, we did that um, using uh, the names of presidential uh, candidates, and we flashed... Uh, search suggestions as people were typing letters, uh, and we deliberately withheld negative search suggestions from some of our participants, and with other participants now and then we allowed a negative to show up on the list. Well, when you show a negative on the list, and right now if you look up Donald Trump is, you will find one negative. When you put a negative on the list, that draws 10 to 15 times as many clicks as neutral or positive terms. So if your algorithm suppresses negative search terms, uh, search suggestions, I should say, for one candidate, uh, as we know Google did for Hillary Clinton, my candidate in 2016, but you allow negatives to appear now and then for the opposing candidate, those negative search suggestions draw a tremendous amount of traffic to websites that show that candidate in a negative light. And what I'm telling you is we have shown that using this technique, we can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea they have been manipulated. We have reason to believe that Google is knowingly, deliberately, strategically manipulating people's thinking and behavior from the very first character people type into the search box. And, and uh, Dr. Epstein, can, can you elaborate? You said we have reason to believe that Google is doing this knowingly and deliberately. Can, can you explain why, why we have reason to believe that? Well, pull out your cell phones. If you, if you type the letter A into Google's search box, by the way, you should never, ever use Google.com, never, because it tracks you. Uh, you should use uh, either something like DuckDuckGo, or my favorite is called StartPage, startpage.com, which has full access to Google's index. But the point is, if you type the letter A into the search box, depending on <clears throat> your relationship with Google and how much they know about you, uh, there's a very good chance that you're going to see Amazon listed in the first position, second position, third position, maybe all three positions, guess what? Amazon is Google's largest advertiser, 
and Google sends more traffic to Amazon than any other company. These are business partners, and Google is trying to send you to Amazon when you type the letter A. Type in the letter G. If for what it's worth, I just typed A. I got Amazon, Area 51 Raid, <laughs> and Amazon Prime. So those are the three Google suggestions, two of which are Amazon. Wow, that's, that's actually something, because I'm assuming you don't block them in any, any way, so they know all about you, and they're still trying to send you to Amazon and Amazon Prime. But type in the letter G and you'll get something different. If you type in the letter G, there's a good chance you're gonna get a list of Google products. They're trying to send you to Google. And the lesson here for all of us is, if you start a company, make sure the name of it does not begin with the letter G. Thank you very much. Thank you to each of you for very illuminating testimony. I appreciate your being here. I want to thank all the witnesses who testified before the subcommittee. Uh, we will be keeping the hearing record open for an additional two weeks, which means the record will be closed at the end of the business day on Tuesday, July 30th, 2019. Senators uh, may submit follow-up questions to witnesses by that date, and, and if there are follow-up questions, the witnesses are asked uh, to respond as soon as possible in, in writing. And with that, uh, this hearing was not sponsored by the letter G, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>